I failed as a father in, in that sense, and that is all down to, to, to my pathways into addiction, of course. I do rituals every day of my life. I'm controlled by these rituals. There's some of them that I do. You know, I've got them in my house, set things that I have to do before I leave the house, certain things I can't wear together. Basically, they all, they're all surrounded by bad things happening to myself or my loved ones. He never ever forced drugs down. At this point, I wasn't even using drugs. But like, no one ever forced drugs in my mouth. And, and if I blame him, then I've got a queue of 100 people who are gonna blame me. And they're like, right, if you see anyone stealing, just, just give us a shout. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one stealing, do you know what I mean? Give him like 300 quid. And then he ends up giving me like 20 pounds worth of heroin. If you, if you told me all some of the worst things I'd done, mate, I sold my mum's engagement ring, you know? I sold my mum's engagement ring. Like, I'm not religious, but like I prayed to some sort of higher power and I was like, listen, please let me get out of this alive. And I promise that I will, I will never take drugs again. Like I promise. Information covered up, censorship, corruption. The mainstream media have proven itself to be untrustworthy. I'm here to give a platform for debate for truth, for open discussion. I'm introducing you to my podcast, Silenced with Tommy Robinson. Who exactly is Tommy Robinson? Or Stephen Gatsby Lennon? Yeah, with the English Defence League, the EDL. The problem is with Islamic way. English far-right Islamophobic activism. Since then, there's been organised protests across the country in London, Manchester, Leeds. People in their thousands are marching for Robinson's There is no such thing Welcome to my latest edition of Silence, my podcast. Some of you may remember a podcast I was on where I had a scrap, well, I call it scrap, handbags with some little American clown called Derek Diablo. Today, I'm with the gentleman who's responsible for that. Tommy. <laughs> like, let me give you a better instruction, that, Callum. Yeah, don't make me feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> The, re the only reason I drove to Cardiff that day for that podcast was that I met this gentleman when he invited me on his first podcast and I heard his story. It's an inspiring story. Mm. It actually really surprised me when I heard his, his life story and parts of it. So that's what I said that day. So I thought I'd have him on as a guest so many of you can hear, hear his life and hear his story so we can dig a lot deeper on those stories. Yeah, yeah. I, pre I appreciate it, Tom. Like, I, I, I obviously see what you do. Hence why I got you on in the first place. And I understand that you're following probably don't really hear much stories of, of recovery or, 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 you know, the story I've, I've lived. Yeah. So, you know, to, to, to be on here and for you to give me the opportunity for that, like, I, I really appreciate it. So thank you. And I was shocked. So after meeting you, I didn't really know your story. And after yeah. meeting you, when I saw images of you, when you, was, yeah. you, you were bang on heroin. Yeah, yeah I was flat out. When I saw <laughs> the images, I was like, Jesus, man. And to, and to see yeah. someone who's come through it, yeah. it's, it's a hard thing to come through. It's a hard thing yeah, to come Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, like, that's, that's, that's my mission now. You know, we've all got a mission in life, as, as you well know. And, and my mission now is, you know, uh, to inspire as many people as I can, similar to you, but, but in other ways, and, and try and destigmatize. And that's kind of what I, what I do with the... That's why I started the podcast. You know, I... I the reputation I got in my area, in South Wales, you know, before I got clean was, was not a good one. And, you know, shit sticks. Um, and, you know, labels like junkie, smackhead, rat, thief, you know. I was called a burglar, I never burgled out in my life, but you know, the, the, these words stick, don't they? And, and, I, and I know that you go through the same thing, you know. You, you say Tommy Robinson, people will call you a racist, <laughs> wouldn't they, you know? And, and, and my mission from, 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 you know, even though before I got clean, I never thought I'd ever turn my life around. When I did do it, I thought I have to now live my life just trying to drum it into people that there is more to life than, than that. And people can change. And it isn't a second chance. Sometimes it takes fucking 20 times. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes 10 prison sentences and 20 rehabs to, to finally get it in your fucking head that it's, it's, it's time to change. But we've got to give people chances. I, of course, I think some things are, you know, unforgivable. You know, some things you cannot come back from, certain things that people do, which is just... You know, yeah, certain, right cr up. certain certain crimes or horrific crimes against children. But when, yeah. when we're on this, because I used to view junkies in a very negative way. Yeah. You know? Lots of people do. 
scum. Yeah. Yeah? Scum. And then yeah. un until I went and spent, I, was, I spent time yeah. at a rehab centre. Yeah, hello. Listening. And then I start, and they say, look for, the, look for what you have in common rather than the differences you have. And then I started on listening to people and thinking, he's a good guy. He's a nice guy. And he, he's had a terrible turn in life that's drove me. Yeah. But can I just rewind to, yeah. to, to the start of your life? Where are you from? I'm from Cardiff, capital, capital city of Wales. Um, I've still got you saved under Cardiff podcast. That's just terrible. <laughs> that is absolutely... I refuse to change you know, it. We've, we've got some history now, man. <laughs> it's, they're in the history books, man. Cardiff podcast. Best podcast of 2023, I think. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh yeah, it you know, did well. It did well. I, I remember telling you afterwards, said you just got, got a viral, viral moment. You just got a viral <laughs> moment. Bro. I come here and give you that. Yeah, yeah. and to be honest, he, he haven't shut up about it, you know, that Diablo. But we'll, we'll, we'll get we'll, onto we'll, that. We'll get onto that in a yeah. bit. Um, but yeah, I'm from Cardiff. Um, I, I grew up in. I grew up on a council estate. Um, but my mem, my mum and dad were like they're still together to this day, and uh, they've. They provided me everything in life, you know, like, I, like they have been through thick and thin with me. And, you know, we'll get on to this, but this is what we mean about, you know, these, jun these junkies, these, these smackheads, these crackheads, these cokeheads. They're not really bad people. A lot of these people come from good backgrounds and just fall away, you know, fall to the wayside uh, kind of thing. And that was, that was me, you know, growing up uh, from up to 15, my memories were... were, were were coated in in candy like do you know what i mean literally like fluffy candy that's all i remember um i, I you know i have got like you know family members who, who you know who had reputations and and probably impacted the family in ways but my family were anti-drugs and stuff growing up my dad was like my football coach he was my rugby coach you know he, he was like the father figure of our community my age um anyway and uh, growing up we, we we had everything, and if you know if I didn't have the the, the new trainers and the new fucking oh, Liverpool top, it so was you're like, spoiled. I was spoiled, man. Yeah. yeah, you know, like I was. I was a spoiled kid. Mm. Um, but we were anti-drug as well. We yeah. were very very anti-drug growing up. Um, so like you know when I got into my kind of teens, you know when I you know the boys are smoking weed and drinking and taking fags, like I felt like my mum and dad were much more stricter on me than any of my other parents, you know, like my, my you know, my best mate's old, mate, old man and I was smoking like Rocky weed. and stuff yeah, and yeah. we'd nick the Rocky and we'd roll it in his garden and, and the mum and dad knew like they didn't really care. My mum and dad would fucking batter me if I was smoking, do you know what yeah. I mean? And so we were very anti-drug and that was because of my uncle, my father's brother, who, um, he was an addict. He went to jail uh, uh, when he was 16 for uh, death by da dangerous driving. He, he ran over a little girl and, uh, that kind of ruined uh, my, my family a bit like that. Like he was written in the papers and that and calling my grandmother a, a, an alcoholic and stuff, which she wasn't, Sun newspaper for you. Yeah. Um, and just like, it just ruined the family and it gave me a bit of a, you know, growing up in school and that, like my Reputation. surname, yeah. Mm. Just the surname, innit? You know, he's a mace fucking, you know, jog him on sort of thing. So because like, you, I guess you were your uncle, and that was seen him as a problematic family. He was, he was, yeah. He, well, he was. He was a very problematic child. In nowadays, you just call it dyslexia and ADHD. ADHD. You know, <laughs> but back then he was just, yeah, he was handful. Something wrong with him, like you know, mm. and uh, he, you know, nineteen ninety six. Everyone was joyriding. That was like the in thing back then. You could nick a car and fucking, and he was, we, there was always burnout cars at the end of the estate, where you don't see them now as much because you can't really nick them. But you know, back then, it, that was what everyone was doing. And 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 he 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 got into an accident with a few of his mates. He was the only one who stayed there. He was sixteen, and uh, the, the girl died in his hands. And How old was the girl? Nine. Yeah, you know, and this is what I'm saying, you know the stigma, we will talk about the stigma, the brand that people would call him... Child killer. Kitty killer. Child when killer. I think of a kitty killer, I think of fucking... Someone who's gone out and intentionally murdered him. Yeah, uh, Ian Hedley and child. fucking proper nonces, like, do you yeah. know what I mean? He's run a child over and had a stupid... Nonce. He was a child himself. Yeah, 16. 16, going to meet a bird with his mates, and just drunk, and, 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 and it happened. And yeah, he didn't plan it. No, of course, he never went off that day to do that, no. So that had a massive, massive impact on my, my childhood. And, How old and was you when that happened? I was six. It was 96. Yeah. I was born in 91. Mm. Five, six. And then from the age of six, all I ever remember was every weekend or every other weekend, 
just going to prison, like visiting him. See him. Portland, Exeter, Park, Cardiff, Bristol, you know, Birmingham, just, just, as, and that was like a weekend away, like going to visit my uncle, you know, and um, yeah, it, it, it had a big impact on my life. And I think that is why my family were anti, Drugs. anti drug. But when I look at that now and I speak to people, I feel like in life we go through like um, cycles. So you know if someone has a bad upbringing, they're like, I am never gonna let my children go through what I went through. Yeah. And then they end up being the spoiled kids, their kids. Yeah, yeah. But then when they grow up, they've never really had to fend for themselves. And so then they, there's no happy <clears throat> medium. So then they end up being the ones who do fuck all for themselves <coughs> because they were relying on their parents. Mm. And it's like a cycle, that's, that's what I think. Because all my mates, who would allow so what's your kids going to be like then? <laughs> what does that mean? What does that cycle mean? <laughs> well, I got a kid who's twelve. I don't see her. She's, she's damaged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had her when I was six. I had her when I was uh, nineteen. The baby mother was sixteen. Um, I, I didn't want to have her. Like I was just banging this bird in a flat locally to me. Like you know, you know, I lived like on the on this estate and you know you know when you have a set of shops you've got a load of block of flats around the fl shops mm -hmm. and these block of flats which are in our area um unfortunately the the people who live in the blocks of flats none of them are from our area does that make sense yeah, yeah. they're council houses and they're either migrants or they're either people from other areas who are or, or youngsters who were brought up in hostels mm -hmm. and then they give them a, a flat at okay. the age of like 17 18 you know <coughs> so they've obviously had like damaged upbringings and my dad used to say listen don't go down there no, no, nothing good grows down there, and no one from our area is from there. So mm. just stay. Away. But I, I was attracted to that. It was like a magnet to me going down there, mm. and um, you know, outside the shops and stuff. And you know, if, if if a girl got drafted in from the hostels to a new flat, and she's playing music, you know, with a bottle of wine in the window, obviously I'm going to go up there, and I like, you know, <laughs> that's what you do. So um, I ended up shacking it with some some girl in there, and. Uh, Straight from the get go, it was just a, a volatile relationship. I got stabbed by her, she sprayed what, bleach in my this, eye. What, I'm 19, you? she's 16, yeah. 17. And, uh, well, I tell her, like, I was 18, she was about 16, 17. But when we had, when I had the kid with her, I, you know, I was 19 when my yeah. daughter was born. Um, she was, again, like I said, if, you, if you're being given a flat at the age of 16, yeah. you've obviously got some serious issues. Um, and uh, she, she she was wild, and we were both wild, and um, yeah, she she was violent, like a violent person. Like I think now in in this day and age, they would say like, you know, I was a, I was a victim of victim domestic of violence. <laughs> you know, it's, it can happen to men too, <laughs> one of them, like because I never laid hands on her. Um, but then you know, I, I was never with her, and then I remember I I fucked her off and whatever, and she came up to me saying I'm pregnant, and I was like, well. You know, and, 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 and looking back, I'm on the cusp of addiction at the time. And, you know, I just was like, I, obviously, I don't want a kid. I'm a kid myself. And, you know, and I look back now and I regret that. But she shouldn't have had the kid, I don't think, herself. And, um, yeah, she did. And then I fell into my depths of addiction. So by the time I, I came out of that, which is now my daughter's 10, 11, um, I have made contact. She stayed over... She's been well. She was staying over my house and stuff, but she's at that age now where she don't want to see her father. She thinks I'm a, I'm a cunt, really. Like if I'm being totally honest, and I've what, I failed there. She thinks you're a cunt because of the ten years where you wasn't. There. I think so. Yeah, I failed as a father in in that sense, and that is all down to 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 my pathway into addiction, of course. Um, do, you I, not, do your family get to see her? No, no, no. It's it's pretty bad. Like you know. When was the last time you saw her? Um, Last year, about eight months ago. That must be hard, man. What's her name? Imogen. Imogen. And what 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 upbringing did she have for those ten years? Do you know, when you weren't there. So so like I said, her mother was, I think at the time, which I, I it's probably. I'm not 100 percent certain yet, but I think at the time she was more concerned about getting at me, so I'm gonna have the baby. Watch, you'll you'll want to know and all that yeah. type of thing. But she was really vulnerable as well. She was nuts. <laughs> and, um, you know, that it proved because after a year, she's handed the baby over to her mother. So her grandmother, Debbie, has, has been, up. has brought the baby up. And she's, and like, she's old school Debbie. Like, like my daughter's mixed race. So okay. a, a black family, Debbie is like really old school. And uh, she's brought up my daughter. And um, 
you know, I'm embarrassed, obviously, I'm embarrassed about it. Um, it's, 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 it's not something I'm proud of. So I think when I, you know, when, when I talk about, you know, if I have a kid now, I've already got one. I would love to have another one and kind of make it right with that, you know. Mm. Um, but the upbringing she had, I think Debbie gave it as much as she could. But obviously she ain't got her, her parents in her life, so. She ain't got a mum or dad. No, <clears throat> and she's quite sassy, man. Like, you know, when I started to meet her and stuff and I was like blown back with the way, you know, the way she goes about herself. And, you know, there was times where I'd be like, yo, you, you can't fucking say that. Or why are you acting this way? But I'm like, hang on a minute, Cole. I've been in a life for 10 years, what do you expect? So it, it's a bit of a mad one and, and, you know, I think this isn't me being a coward in any type of way. I, 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 I was a coward. I have made contact. She's got my number. She knows I am here whenever she wants me. I think it's just one of those things that I have to wait until she's at the right age to, to want to come. Like, and at that time, hopefully, you know, I'm three years into my sobriety now. I'm hoping by that time, three, four years, I'll be in a very stable place in my life where I can you know, she can come and live with me, like, you know? Is she near you? Is she near you? Um, in the same city. Yeah. You know? Wow. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, I've never really spoken about it, to be honest, Tom. You know, I've been on, like, a podcast before, and obviously I've got my own podcast, and don't really talk about it much, you know? And it, it, it is, it's, it's one of my, um, my biggest shames in life, you know, that, that, just the way it went, you know, and, and, and that was just down is that, to me. Is it, not is, it too no late to, is it too late to fix that, Shane? Well, I can't really preach <clears throat> about it never being too late to change of and, and then write that off. So, of course, you know, I, I, I am going to, you know, I'm going to be there for her and I, I'm pretty sure we'll have some good good years yeah. together. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's just one of those things, isn't it? Can we rewind to when you, you, you leave school at 15, 16? Yeah. Good grades? Was you intelligent? Um, what was your interest I'm, I'm, a, I'm an intelligent person, yeah. I was a sporty kid. Um, I was intelligent. I was like the joker of the class. Um, you know, I think if you had a yearbook, you'd probably put me down most likely to be a comedian or something. Yeah. Like, not a fucking heroin addict. Like, people were shocked. Um, you know, I was that type of person, if you're smoking around the back, I'm taking the fag out of your mouth and saying, what are you doing smoking, you weirdo? Yeah. Get out of your mouth. Um, I dang around with everyone, you know, the, the moshers, the, you know, the emos, the goths, the sporty lads, the weed smokers, the girls. I dang around with everyone. Um, I had my core set of friends who, out of school, we chilled. But um, in they, were, they all went to a Catholic school, they did. Um, so I had my school friends and everyone I chilled with. But then outside, I had I, I had my core friends. But I, I dang, hang around with everyone. Um, but that's kind of when it, 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 it went it went all Pete Tong for me is when I left school because, which a lot of people don't re really know, uh, I put my addiction into like three categories and one of them is my mental health. Yeah. Um, and I know we're in, we're in this era now where like, oh, mental health and you know, it, it cringes me. I'm not gonna lie, like sometimes it does cringe me when you hear people, you know, I've got a mental health page and this and that and that. And it, you know, I think some people just do it. It's become fashionable. It's become fashionable. Mm. The, the, there's a lot of things. Out, it's, it's like cold water therapy. <coughs> Everyone's got a fucking cold water therapy bag. <laughs> yeah. oh, I think I'm one of them. <laughs> That's what I was doing in Spain. No, 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 it's good. It's brilliant. <laughs> It's brilliant, like we'll climbing you know, mountains, isn't it? Yeah, that's fucking amazing. No, listen, it's a good trend, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. But everyone's doing it now, really. Yeah, yeah. Some people, like I don't even know why I'm doing this, but I'm doing it, like yeah. you know. Just put it on my Instagram. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. So um, I think Tuffy's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's good as gold. No, um, but but that's what I'm saying. Like you know, it, just that, because no, it's, it's tough to see you. I was sitting in the cold water one of them in Spain. I know you was. I, was, I, was, I, was, I watched one of them. Yeah. <clears throat> no, but you know that, that, that's what it was, and then you know, so so my mental health though w was w was obvious at a young age. So um, in what sense? In what I'm sense? diagnosed with severe OCD. Okay. Okay, and um, you probably haven't noticed it when I come in here, like but, I, but like I'll touch like I'll touch things and that. So basically, um, it's all around. Uh, I think it's like anxiety and stuff like that. Um, basically. I do rituals every day of my life. I'm controlled by these rituals. There's some of them that I do. You know, I've got them in my house, set things that I have to do before I leave the house, certain things I can't wear together, 
you know, you know, you have the volumes on an even number, all those ones that are kind of universally universally known. But then I have these other ones which like basically they all they're all surrounded by bad things happening to myself or my loved ones. So like my mother, my father, or whoever. So say like my mum and dad went on holiday when I was younger, like my anxiety would be so bad thinking the plane's gonna crash or they're gonna get killed or whatever, that I would do these rituals to kind of like what? keep talk, in control. Talk me through one ritual. Um, <clears throat> well, 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 that you know. So, so I was, so I used to work, like in like year eleven, and I used to work for an agency just to get some pocket money, and I, and they were they were coming home from holiday one time, and I was working in the Celtic Manor Hotel, and um, I was behind the bar, and something told me they were flying home that night, and something told me I was on the bar with a manager, and he was like, right. You've got to pour yourself half a pint of vodka whilst I'm working, and I've got to down it without him seeing. Otherwise, the plane's gonna crash. <laughs> Just mad shit like that. So it's, no, you think that's that, that that sounds genuine. like he's finding an excuse to get on it. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, no. no it could, but it like could be anything. Not a ritual. It could be fucking roll down a bank. I could be walking down a road, and he'll say, "Right, jump in the lake." And if you don't jump in the lake, don't give me ideas. Have you got a lake? But <laughs> what I'm matter. saying is, he's kipping. <laughs> what I'm saying is, like these things, they can they can fluctuate from time to time. It depends where I am, what the event is. If I'm travelling up the country or something, I'll have to do rituals and that to make sure I get there in one piece. It's kind of like karma. What, like putting things little, out there. Random yeah? little things would jump into. One hundred percent, yeah, it's really bad. Um, and and at a young age, like I obviously I didn't know what it was, so like. I'd be like walking around lampposts. Like we get, I remember like I got chased by the police and I missed the lamppost. Mm. So I had to run back and touch the lamppost and the police officer's looking at me like, what the fuck is this kid doing? And my mate who was with me was, and there was a few of us and my mate went, don't worry, he's missed the lamppost. Like they knew what I was doing. <laughs> you know, like, I, I'm, 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 I'm growing up, my mates did know, like it, I used to make a joke of it, like, do you know what I mean? And, um, and you still can, do you still have all that now? Yeah, yeah. Have yeah. you ever ever had to try to see? I mean, counselling right now I to understand what that is. Yeah. And 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 they're telling me that it comes from some sort of trauma. Yeah. Um, they think it's a separation anxiety. And you know, doctors back in the day would be like, uh, "Well, what did you try? Have you ever have you ever not done it?" And I'm like, "No." And they're like, "Why?" I'm like, "Because I don't want the fucking plane to crash." You know, it's like I'm too. It's like. You know, if you put the lottery on every day, every week, yeah. and then the one week you don't, then your lottery numbers come in. Like, yeah. how are you gonna, how are you gonna feel? And it's probably your luck that they will come in that yeah, week. Yeah. That's how I feel, um, I, I, and it's just overwhelming, overbearing. So that's that's what it is. So, at the, so speaking to the counselor now, he thinks it's to do with like separation anxiety and different aces in my life. But I always thought like I used to dig for tr like you know like when I asked myself with my addiction and that. They always say tackle the root problem, you know. Tackle the root, and you will, you will find your answer of why you use drugs or why you have this problem. And I used to dig, like for trauma, you know, to the point like where I'd imagine things did happen when they really didn't. Like, you know, was I nonced as a kid? Did I see someone get killed? Like, yeah, trying no. to you're trying to understand it. What drove me here? Because when you sit and listen yeah. to other people talk about their problems, many of them have been nonce. Many of them have had horrific things which have driven them to that place. I'm in crack houses with people who have literally been sexual. Yeah, traffic, nonce, tied up to radiators, beat up as kids. And I'm like, why am I here? And I have tried digging. But what I've noticed now, it could be the smallest of things that you don't realise. Mm. And, 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 and like they think that like it's... He reckons people have left my life like things. So like when I grew up, when I was first born, my mum had postnatal depression, and she's like, so I lived with my grandmother for the first couple of months, yeah? And like, then, then I used to like, when I grew up and I was in like primary, I used to have any excuse to go to my grandmother's. And then, they only live around the corner, but I like living with my grandmother. So like, you know, he said, well the first one's your mum, you know, pushing you away at that young age, you might not remember it, but, but this is something that happened. And then my uncle lived with my grandmother, you know, when I was young, six, five, six, that car crash, he's gone away. And then what happened was that, that destroyed my family, my, my grandmother and, and my granddad. So then she left in the early 2000s because they had a divorce. She moved to Corby, yeah? I knew there was a family connection to Corby. Yeah, she, left, she went to Corby, where she's from. Okay. Um, 
So she went, who was like my fucking rock and soul. And although she was like, yeah, but the house will still be, still be here. The door will be open for you. I just didn't want to go down there with my granddad. As much as I love my granddad, it wasn't that bond. It was my nan. It was my granny. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So she went. And then, you know, there was things like that that happened. And he's like, these little things, yeah. And then by the time I was 15, 16, when I did have this, all these things have happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, it's a separation. So, you know, is that it? I don't know. This counsel I'm with seems to think this is why you are like this. Mm. Um, so having that, like I said, back then, 2007, 2008, it, you know, mental health wasn't really around like that conversation. It wasn't Instagram pages and, and YouTube videos. If you spoke videos. to anyone like that, they'd probably laugh. They fucking, yeah, <laughs> Fuck. well, the, the OCD, we used to just laugh Drinking about a bottle it. of vodka. But it was funny, like, yeah. do you know what I mean? Used to like bite things and I don't know all that and like say things like repeatedly in my like so I'd say things four times in my so I'd say what's happening what's happening what's happening what's happening and then, you know what I mean yeah yeah, uh, yeah. you know it, it, I'd have like I had to have everything even so I'd have two showers but then I might have a third one if I was third I gotta have a fourth one you know I used to go for like a pack of wet wipes in a day and shit just random shit obsessive obsessive shit you know so. What happened was, because there wasn't, you know, I'm going to the doctors to talk about my mental health, because there wasn't mm. that, mm. I kind of started to self-medicate. I started to experiment, alcohol. Drinking was fine anyway. At what age is this? Yeah, 15, 15, 15 16. Yeah. And to be fair, right, you know I say we were anti-drug? This is the society we live in, and this is why it's such a big problem. Alcohol. Cocaine and alcohol, are, are, you know, they're, fuck, they're fucking a big problem, isn't they? But alcohol is so embedded in society, like it's a normal thing. It's the biggest killer yeah. in drugs, alcohol. More people in jail because of alcohol. Yeah. But you know, like I say, like my mum and dad were anti-drugs, weed, they'd fucking kill me smoking a spliff. You know, I'd have a puff of a spliff when I started. I'm having a pack of chewing gums, I'm spraying myself, my mum's going to kill me, you know? Yeah. But alcohol was fine. I could be 10 years of age and my mum's going, go on, have some fucking sangria on holiday. Or, mm. like, alcohol was normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the weed wasn't. They didn't like the weed. You ain't smoking that shit. And alcohol was just as But bad. alcohol, they would feed me alcohol, you know? So, I start, you know, I started drinking, like, as we did anyway, growing up on the estates, flagging a Strongbow, £2.50. Remember that? Strong, yeah. Strongbow, £2 or whatever. And Lambrini's was that? Lambrini, yeah. Uh, this rosé one. <laughs> the red one. <laughs> you know, like, you know, just drinking. And then the boys, that's when the boys started trying cocaine and stuff. So when how the old, boys... How old are you? I'm 32. Okay. So you're the I'm still quite young. Okay, like. yeah. That's because cause when, when, when I was leaving school, the lads weren't trying cocaine. But by the time my ex-wife's brother was leaving school so it was all, that error they're yeah. all chipping in yeah 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 for, well that's what happened for the school for the what's it called when for the school prom the prom yeah chipping, chipping in, in for buying grams coke. yeah yeah i was like what's going on when you could buy a gram for 50 yeah kids. that was unheard of though yeah. in, when i was leaving school but that next generation yes. down which you were probably pills yeah your the pills coming on the cards yeah. your generation down so my generation was and, and, and at that time when they started the boys who were smoking weed all the time started onto the coke when we were playing youth rugby I was delayed. I got onto the weed. Okay. And I remember having my first spliff and I fucking, similar to when I got on the other drug, which I'll talk about, it just took away all my anxieties. I just, I was like, why haven't I been smoking this all along? You know, and that OCD that I have come into play and I got really obsessed with smoking weed. It, it took away all my anxieties. It made me feel good. And I was doing something that it became ritualistic. So I become the kid who would never really smoke weed to becoming the biggest weed head out of all my mates. Mm. But not mm. just like, you know, uh, you know, a big weed head with a fucking, you know, a, a cue on the table, a grinder, my grinding train. Like it come to a point where it was like problematic. So I would sell my PlayStation. I would. To buy weed? Yes. Okay. I'm not talking about crack now, I'm no, talking no, about no, weed. weed. You know, um, Which usually people don't, when people don't have an addiction level to weed like that. <laughs> that well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It doesn't affect their day to day. I, I start, it become problematic. Oh, I need to wake and bake, I need one in the morning. Need to, you know, it, it come to a point where I was smoking it, you know, I needed a, you know, it, it was, I'd, let's have a spliff and have something to eat. And then it would be like, I need one before, after. 
I was just smoking all day. I was smoking cues, uh, fountains, you know, just, I was really bad on weed. And, and Was you working? I was working. I never ever held down a job. It was always like Christmas temp jobs, agency work, always in a kitchen or a bar. Um, and that was because with agency work, they'd get me in these random pubs and hotels and like Cheltenham races and stuff. Mm. So I used to rob the tills at the same time. So I'd rob the tills, so I'd, you know, three, four hundred pound, and then I'd get paid a week later. Yeah. So, and, uh, you know, it was a nice little hustle I had. Um, but, you know, it, it became that bad, like anything that you abuse, it will, buy, you, you know, it'll end up being your problem. And the reason I started smoking weed to take away those anxieties ended up being the effects I had on weed. Mm. So I'd have a spliff and I'm all paranoid, you know, because I abused it that much in a space of a, a year, not even that. Um, so I thought, I need to find something else now. I need to find, you know, another drug, really, that will take away the fucking OCD that controls my life. You know, it's exhausting, um, but it can't be weed. So I started, like, dabbling with Valiums, pre-gabs, uh, you know, them type of downers and stuff. I was taking cocaine, tried cocaine and stuff. It wasn't really for me. You know, um, and then what happened was, you know, everything kind of came crashing really quickly and it all happened at once. So what happened was um, I uh, fell out of a relationship with, with my best mate. A friend? Like, a friend, a a best mate, a my best mate. Okay. Done everything together, um, you know. Which uh, fall out over? Yeah, it's, it's terrible, a female. You took his girl, he took I your girl. I never took his girl. Is that what he thinks? What happened was, uh, growing up, you have a child, a sweetheart, don't you? Someone you, you, you know, obsessed you're with. with. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're, yeah, yeah, you're obsessed with, you might, you know, that's your piece in it, like you're with growing up. Oh, and, he was going out of her as a child? Yeah. Okay. Uh, like high school and that. Yep. Um, and then after high school, they broke up and I slept with her. But that's it, that's my best mate's, like, yeah. Bro, broke they, the rule, bro. They were, uh, bro, shut you up, broke man. The Don't rule. be like that, man. Please. That's like, I know, I know. It's embarrassing, like, and I, I'm ashamed of it. I was a dog back then. Like, I would, like, you, you couldn't spoke, trust your cat you, around me at you that spoke time. To, you spoke to your mate now? I have, yeah. Are you mates again? Yeah. Okay, that's good. He came up to my house two days ago. Okay. Um, to buy a phone off me. Mm. Uh, we're good now, we're good. But it, you know. So you fell out of him and that major. So what that did was that what that did, we all hung around together. So if I wanted to hang around with any of the other boys, he'd be there. So I had to draw myself away from. He he didn't have to go nowhere. I had to go. I fucked up. I knew that it was never did like. The, did the other group of lads also push? Well, out? you know, they used to say like, "Why are you coming out with us, bro?" We, we used to, you know, and people would say, "You coming?" But they knew I was never going to do it. Like, mm. I, like I fucked up, yeah, not yeah. him. I'm not going to say to you, you go. Like, yeah. I, I was embarrassed of myself, like, you know? And although I thought me, I, I genuinely she, thought she after fit. the year. She fit. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty girl, yeah. I don't want to say this one time. <laughs> really fucking look like. No, 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 no. Like, yeah, she was, she was a pretty girl, man. And, and, and like, you know, obviously, I genuinely thought in a year's time, two years' time, we'll be back blessed. You know, mm. but um, it just, it got worse. It got more toxic. And like, yeah, it was, we had a big fight one one day when, it, when, when I told him about it. A punch up. Punch up. From the local pub to our house. We lived right by each other, like fucking 10 minutes walking distance. How old are you at this point? 17. 17. And now, although back, if you talk about when I was trivial, it was the end of the world for me. That yeah, was yeah, the your end best of my mate, world. your closest mate, it's like losing your brother. That was the end of the world for me. Mm. So what happened was, you know, uh, uh, one of the factors that I put in f for being on, on heroin is bad timing and the people you hang around with. Uh, and my uncle came out of prison, you know. Was he on heroin? Around that time. Did your uncle come out and was your uncle on heroin? My uncle was 10 feet tall to me, you know, growing up, going to visit him in prison listening to the stories he tell me, you know, yeah, we, you know, uh, just, 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 you know, stories right now, they're just like, fuck off, mate, grow up. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it was like a movie to me, yeah, mm-hmm. like, you know. And, you know, people used to always say, when's, when's he out? When's he out? Yo, I hear he's big. I hear he's got big, you know. And, you know, wait till he's out. You know, Jay, it was like a big anticipation for when he gets out and stuff. Um, How long did he do? So we, so we had eight years for that. Serve eight years. Back then, you had to do three quarters three of thirds, it. Two thirds, yeah. Two thirds. Two thirds, I think. Maybe. Something like yeah, that, yeah. he done six like years. six or seven years, yeah, at the age of 16. So we'd done that. He came out, kind of, not right all his wrongs, but kind of come out as this ruthless guy, reputation, but I'm still young. Yeah. And then he went back in for another four. And then when he came out off of that four, is when when you're at that age. I'm like, oh, okay. I've heard the stories of what he's like on road, like, and and back then as well, like, you know, um, I, I used to MC uh, Grime as well, like, it was big yeah. growing up, yeah, in Cardiff, yeah, yeah. We're, we're only down the M4 from London. Bristol's over the bridge, like, it's a big, like, Cardiff has got a big, um, yeah, a musical um, kind of scene really mm. and 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 you know we went from you know it, it drip it drip fed through garage into grime like you know so um yeah i was you know and and like you know that was like we used to beef with the Ely boys across across the bridge and stuff so like hanging around with him would have been good to like write in my music you know it was just mm. like i want to chill with this guy and all that you know and um you know i was kind of doing fuck all at the time i was on my own i was taking valiums i was depressed i was drinking i was fucking random girls i was in that block of flats all around that time and uh, he came out of prison and i started hanging around with him and uh for the first time in my life you know every you know i felt like i was wanted like i felt like i belonged somewhere with him like you know he took me under his wing a bit and although that's my father's brother you know and i, I think i I think my dad was in a bit of a tough situation because he knew exactly what his brother was like. Mm. He knew he was probably a bad influence on me. But at the same time, he thought, nah, he'll, he'll look after him. Because it's my dad's little brother, you know? So he's like, he don't want to tell him, listen, fuck off. Yeah. So he was in a bit of a mad situation. So I started hanging around with him. And um, yeah, I just saw a total different life. So, so he... he when he came out of prison that time, obviously over all the, the beard he done, he kind of like built his kind of connections and whatever. And uh, you know, we call it county lines now, but back this is like 2007, 2008. I was seeing this stuff. You know, he was bringing people he met from London, Birmingham, setting up lines for them and stuff. And he would yeah. be there kind of heavy as well. So we'd be like, "Come on, we're going on a trip." And he'd be kidnapping people with me. And I'd be in the car with him and he's literally kidnapping people. I was, yeah, like, he, he was just a mad guy. And, like, he was a smoker as well. So, he, you know... When you he say was a smoker, probably, what do you mean? He was, he was, he was a crack. user. He well, was rocks, a user. Smoking rocks. Crack, yeah. Brown, 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 but he, he was like, I don't smoke the gear. No, no, no. It was crack mainly. Um, he, was a, he, was a, he was a smoker. Um, so I think they kind of used him. You know, he's a couple of stones. Go and kidnap this guy for me, yeah. you know? But um, he used to look after stuff and that as well. And I, you know, I, I, I've been in his flat and, you know, he's looking after fucking guns that have probably been used in like four murders and stuff. And I'm holding it, thinking I'm cool as fuck, shooting it and all that in a, in a block of flats and stuff, just mad stuff. Mm. Thinking like, you know, I'm okay because I'm with him. And uh, I think when you're around, you know, you, get, you become desensitized to stuff, don't you? And I started seeing people smoking crack a lot on the can and uh, seeing like this dark stuff, which I didn't really know what it was at the time. It was heroin. And uh, I wanted to feel like, I, I wanted to belong with them so much that I started, I, I was kind of groomed in a way. You know, I started being a little, uh, a Joey for him, you know? You are cold, went on a bus stop, give him them, you know? Didn't want nothing for them, I like, just thought it was cool. I've got these wraps in my hand and I'm gonna go and lick and a shot. And your dad's brother was, doing, was there when you were doing this? Yeah. yeah. But that's caused murders with your dad. Yeah, you know it's 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 a it's a weird one. Like they don't really speak now. Like he he'll never shut the door on him. Like, but he's, you know, because you know what my dad's always done. Like, yeah, I think like my dad don't want to admit that like his brother would let his son be around that. Yeah. And and and, and I agree <coughs> to a way because I blame myself for why. Like I knew what heroin and crack was when I was fucking ten. Like I said, my family were anti-drug. We learn about drugs in school. We just know, don't we? And um, I think if 
he never ever forced drugs down. At this point, I wasn't even using drugs. But like, no one ever forced drugs in my mouth. And, and if I blame him, then I've got a queue of 100 people who are gonna blame me for getting yeah, them yeah, on yeah. stuff. You know, and, and I, I haven't done that, <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, yeah, like I started like being, becoming desensitized to it. And then like, another thing that I, like, I want people to know as well is, the, the funny thing is, the first time I smoked crack, wasn't even with my uncle, you know, it was with boys I grew up with. Um, I went out one night uh, with, with, with a school friend and he was using coke, so I started sniffing with him. And I went back to a flat. I went back to a flat and there was, you know, some of my uncle's mates were there, but my mates were there as well and, and they were all smoking crack. And uh, this is what I'm saying, it's so normalised where I'm from. Like, yeah, see, that's is, that, is that mad? Is that yeah, mad? that's mad. Is that mad? Because that's not, see, I is remember, that mad, like? when I went, to jail, I went to jail, and I ended up in jail with lads from Biggleswade, and the lads from Biggleswade were talking about smoking mocks, and yeah. I said, you lot smoke mocks. Yeah, that's mad, isn't it? I said, that's what I said to you on the podcast, there was, you, you smoke the white? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, nah, bro. <laughs> what do you, I said, what do you mean you smoke mocks? I said, like, round my way, that's tramps. Yeah. But none of the lads smoke yeah. rocks. But then on the, on the on the estate of Farley Hill, because the main lads got involved in it, all the youngsters coming Think through, they're involved yeah. in it. They're looking up to the, the main lads on the estate. Yeah, yeah. The main lads on our, where we were from, were against that. Yeah, yeah. They might have been sniffing a bit of coke, smoking a bit of weed. Well, that's but crack, heroin, kind of, the whole different Well, that's where, where I'm from, Fairwater. So we, we share a postcode with Ely. I don't know if you've heard of Ely. No. They had the riots here a couple of months ago. Oh, back, yeah, where they were burning they, like, over the boy who got run off yeah, the motorbikes. Yeah, so that's Ely. So okay. we share the same postcode. Ely, you've got kids age 10. Smoking. On bikes, not smoking, on bikes, peddling heroin. Heroin, crack, it's always been there since the 90s, 80s, whatever, yeah? Fairwater was more of a working man's place. The rugby boys, the football boys, it's coke, that's it. Yeah, that's working man's, have a sniff. Like if you're smoking crack, you're getting fucked up. Yeah, yeah, Do basically. I mean? And Do if you're I mean? selling it, like if any of the lads were selling yeah. it, everyone turned on them. But, like, every year, like growing up, right, you'd have, so we all played rugby, right, and we'd all at the end of the weekend say, yeah, God, now safe, safe, safe. But it'd be like five of you who know who knew where you were going at the end of the night, and you'd all meet back up, and you'd go and score, or you'd buy coke, and you'd wash it back. You know, you learn how to wash it back, and you'd be smoking with one of the olders, or one of the olders would wash it for you, one of the like my mate's brothers or something, and you'd be smoking crack, um, and, and 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 like that's like a known thing. And over the years now, it's became really problematic. Where like everyone's tried it. Like, I, I said it before, like, and it's probably a bold, it's like, you know, this isn't a proven statistic, but I would comfortably say in my, from my area, uh, out of 100% of people who have, 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 have are taking cocaine, I would say 50% of them have tried crack. 30% 30, 30 <coughs> of them got a problem with crack. That's you know, mad. <coughs> they're just smoking crack now. It's mad. But um, that's what I did. I, I, I had a pipe. The, co the cost of smoking crack compared to sniffing cocaine? It's ridiculous. But I don't know. Tell me. Um, it's, if someone if someone gets coke, they're much different age. The thing is, coke is crack is going to go quicker than coke. Yeah, that is, so, so you're always going to need more, yeah, yeah. and that's why it's how much problematic. Can smoke, how much can someone smoke in a night? Crack. Thousands. I've smoked thousands. Thousands of pounds. I've smoked thousands of pounds in one night. Yeah. <coughs> is that being possible to sniff? Fifty in the stones. Night? One <coughs> Fifty stones. One it. Because that be impossible to sniff in a night. Yeah. Impossible. Well, you could smoke. I suppose you could do a bag like on a line, right? <coughs> You'd be off your nut all night, wouldn't you? Probably. Yeah, but you ain't going to get. Yeah. And yeah, you know, you're your, your nose will be fucked yeah, you'll and out. I, I, I've smoked a 50 stone on a, on a pipe, you know? Okay. Um, and like, you know, it's, it's, it, it is, it is, it is mad like, do you know what I mean? And so when was the first time you tried? Well, 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 well just quickly, I wanted to go on, actually, I was saying this before on, uh, I say, I was saying it to Tuffy and I had a lot of people like, uh, well, obviously crack is worse than coke, right? What I was trying to say to people is, right, is, Coke and crack are the exact same things. People who look down, these, I've got people in my ear who look down, now oh, you're a crackhead, but you're flat out sniffing. It's the same thing. It's, it's crack, just... More addictive. It's just more... I, I, I don't even think it's more addictive. I just think because you, you go through it like it's nothing, that it is, it is more addictive. You're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same, what I'm saying. It's the same drug. People just would say, up. you're dirty. You're dirty. It's the same thing. It's probably cleaner. I'm washing the shit out of it. Yeah, yeah. You know? Because people do view a crackhead completely different. Someone's, someone's yeah. sniffing coke is a leisurable drug out on the pub 
the and weed the head looks down at the coke head, the coke head looks down at the crack head, the crack head looks down at the smack head. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. they're all the fucking same. We've all got a problem, haven't we? You know, mm. uh, you know, porn can be a problem, you know, to an extent, I suppose, if you, you know, wank yourself silly, can you? Yeah. So uh, it, it just depends what your addiction is. Um, but yeah, like, so what happened was I was at a party um, and they were all smoking and I just thought, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to have a go. I was sniffing coke already and I had a pipe and... Yeah, it, it blew my it blew my socks off, and it, and it was a great feeling. My ears were ringing, sweating, this euphoric rush that I, I just couldn't explain, you know. And I was sniffing coke all night, so I thought it wouldn't have done anything. But it, you know, it took me that that, that stage up. But um, quickly, you know, it, it started to dawn on me that that that, that paranoid dig feeling. Now you get on coke, I suppose, as well, um, but because of my OCD, you know. <laughs> Cracks a stimulant. It kind of just magnified my paranoia and my, my come down. And uh, I started like obviously someone who was there kind of noticed. I was, yo, you were I mate. Do you know what I mean? And uh, he went, you might have a puff of this, and he offered me a spliff. And I was like, mate, I ain't having none of that, mate. It fucking makes me worse. At this point, I was done with weed. And he was like, no, no, it's not weed. And I was like, well, what is it? He went, it's got gear in it. I said, well, what heroin? He went, yeah. I mean, fuck off. He went, bro. He said, I swear to God, mate. He said, you won't get it. He said, look, you're not going to get addicted. He said, I said, but because I was worried. That I thought you would have a perfect, like, you just start clucking, like, do you know what I mean? I didn't know what, you know, it's, it's, it's just a, it's a big void, isn't it, Halloween? It's like the be all and end all. Well, it's the, one, it's the one thing that I always ask. Everything you taught as a child, everything you hear, what does it, when that person takes that first one, knowing all of that, it's mad, isn't it? Well, with heroin, like you just, well, you're just saying, you know it. Well, the guy sold it to me, yeah? And, and, That's and all right, mate, like you'll this. make you feel better. No, 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 well, yeah. He well, said, won't get addicted. You, you'll take, you know, he said you'll feel better. Is he a dealer? But, no. <laughs> but what he said was, you won't get addicted, you stupid cunt. You've got to smoke this for fucking five days in a row to get a physical addiction. You can have a puff. You can dabble with it. You know, it's not like you're injecting it or you're smoking it on yeah, fire. It's just a spliff. A, yeah. And I've... He sold it to me. Mm. I went, I oh, go on, Ed. But because I was praying that bad, I thought I just needed something to hold Level on to. You out. It looked like a sweet. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, well, by gosh, it leveled me out. You know, this is, you know. In what obvious... way? Explain it. Explain Mate, it. honestly, so, right? I'm like, I, you, you've obviously had anxiety or, or terror, yeah. you know, that thought of like, what's going on? Mm. That's how I was feeling. And in an instant, it just felt like, I was dropped into a warm bath, yeah, and, you know, it felt like, you know, like if you was like just drinking, you know, that like warm buzz off like, you know, two, two, two glasses of cognac, that nice warm feeling, dropped in a bath, and just, everything was peaceful, like, like nothing, I just had no worries whatsoever. I kind of went clear, like clear-minded, where I was a bit drunk and a bit wavy, I had I had I had the puff of that and it kind of sobered me up a little bit, but also got me really warm and a fuzzy feeling. Relax. That I just relaxed, yeah, just like, just like you know, everyone left the room type of thing, you know, mm. like I was back in my safe space. <coughs> and 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 that, although, you know, I went home that night and you know, I just can you can you not my sleep? Head when I did. Can you sleep on heroin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, to be honest, like, you know, you know, I've had it where I've struggled, like, because I've been so itchy. You know, you, uh, people go to jail, they sniff subbies, they're up all night cleaning their cells and stuff because it can have that effect on certain people. I think it's similar to, like, kind of, uh, you know, people who have ADHD, they give them Ritalin. Mm. Someone else, that would make them high. I think yeah, it's kind yeah, of, yeah. it might be something like that, but, you know, I have had nights like that, but, yeah, you fucking sleep all right. But I was so, like... Am I a heroin addict? I've just smoked heroin. Is my life going to end? Type of thing. And then I woke up and it was like nothing happened. Like, you know, and I say it all the time. Although, like, I wasn't physically addicted, obviously. And, you know, I, I wasn't addicted from that moment. But it did have me. Because you're thinking about doing it. Because I'm like, I know I'm going to take that again one day. Mm. I don't know when it is, right? But that was nice. And when, I danced with it. I when, danced. Was it when was it? How long later till you've done it again? So... My uncle was on there that time. Some of his mates, it was one of his mates who offered me that spliff. Um, but I started dropping into him. Because one thing, and I always said, like, I don't know if he was just 
fucking with me or not. But he always used to say, listen, yeah? He said, I don't mind what you do. He said, see this? If anyone gives you this, I'll fucking kill him. I'll kill him. He's going like that. But he's smoking it in front of me, blowing it in my face and stuff. Um, and it got to a point in life where like, he would come, come and get me for money and all that and scoring, oh, come on, I'll get you a bag and all that. Like, so like, I didn't know if he was fucking with me in, at that time. But, I, yeah, I, I, you know, I, had, I, I, I took it that one time. I woke up and I thought, I'll have that again. And uh, it became one of those things that I, you know, that term, danced with the devil. I did. Mm -hmm. I danced with it for about a year without getting a physical addiction. Um, because, you know, a lot of addictions like cocaine, weed and things like that, you know, they, 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 they're psychological, innit? Like, you know, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what heroin was at the time. You know, but I, I never heard of a cluck at that time. I never thought it was, you know, I never had that physical addiction. So for a year, I danced with it. And, uh, you know, we went from every month to every fortnight to every week to three days on. And that's kind of how we went. But for the first kind of couple always of months. Always smoking it. Always smoking it on the foil. And then that was just next level straight away, like a two lines of that. And I'm just like, scratching for hours, bollock naked, rubbing my face. But you, you just, it's like, the, the feeling is like, I can't, I can't explain it like, do you know what I mean? But it was a, it was a beautiful feeling that I yearned for. I, I wanted to take, I wanted to have that feeling. And then I'd stop taking it and for a couple of days I'd feel paranoid, like fuck, I'm, am I a junkie? Like, and you know, trying to hang around with people then to try and be normal and stuff. And then I'd go back to it. You know, I always go back to it. Whilst you're doing this, what happens to the rest of your life? Your normal life, your social life, your friends, your family? Um, it, it, it just dissolves. Um, you know, I stop going, playing sports straight away. Um, I couldn't hold down a job anymore. And I, I'm asking this because at the minute it all sounds great. Yeah, it does. Right, I'm warm, it does. I'm in the bath, I'm having a great time. <laughs> yeah. It's like fucking yeah, euphoric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but, it does, but yeah. What's the reality? Those might give you those feelings. Well, the reality is, I'm, the reality a I'm a lonely person. I'm chilling in a flat. I'm 17, 18. I'm chilling with a guy who's got well. paranoid schizophrenia. You know, his house is, is just disgusting. You know, I'm not going on a boys' holiday with my mates. I'm chilling in a fucking in a, flat, in a flat with Buster. You know, who says, don't shit in my toilet and all that, because he's got all these paranoid, you know, don't, you know, take your shoes off or, you know, just, just, and it's a shithole, like, do you know what I mean? And, and, and I'm not speaking to any of my mates anymore. You know, I, I just lost interest in everything. I just became this reclusive kid, like, who just wanted to go down to the, to, to the flats to go and bun off whoever had heroin. Because at that time, I, I didn't know anyone to score off either. So I'd have to give someone some money and hopefully they'd score for me and then I'd jump on the back of their smoke. And, and, and my existence started to become of how can I get it? Um, and then once I did find out like how to get it, so I remember some kid, as soon as my uncle found out about it, that's when it was game over for me. Because that's when I started to connect. Because basically I got this, va this kid from the valleys who lived in a flat to go and score for me. And the dealer told my uncle, yeah, I think Cullen was with him and all that. So anyway, my uncle went over to the house and, and, and brutally beat up this guy. Like, And I, I thought he was like, oh, he's protecting me. He don't want me on it. But I think he was just fuming at the fact I was going to this guy to score rather than him get it for me. Yeah. Because as soon as that happened, I went over to the flat with him and I started smoking with him. And he was like, I can't believe you was doing this without me and you weren't telling me. At least, you, at least when you're with me, I know you're safe and all that. Like, do you mm. know what I mean? I'll profit off you. <laughs> yeah. And then I that's could have profited off you. And that's what happens, you know? You know, like. You become his little. I'd be him working out, like. You know, he knows it's my payday. We too. Uh, I'm in the kitchen working. I'm out the back. Drop me some money. I haven't got no money. Give me your bank card. No. Give me your bank card. I promise you, I'll be back in a half hour. I've got you some things. And he was just like, yeah, yeah. you are for my bank card, <laughs> you know. And uh, and then and, you know, I'd be giving him like, I'd be I'd be on graphs and I like, you know, I worked in a Millennium Stadium either right, one day, and uh, you know, I used to be like the, the guy who would like count the tills and stuff. So like they'd give me the and, and it was agency staff. I was the only white guy. Everyone else were like from Africa and mm. India, you know. So they were like. 
they trusted me with the money. <laughs> no, it's true. And they're like, right, if you see anyone stealing, just, just give us a shout. <laughs> I'm the one stealing, like, do you know what I mean? I remember the one time I left, I just left. It was New Zealand, Wales, or it was your blacks, I'm sure it was. And uh, half time came, I took all the money out of the float. And I said to this, 700 quid. Yeah, yeah. I said to this woman, I said, keep an eye on the tills, I just gotta go count up. She went, yeah, no worries. I just watched the rest of the game and then left. But I remember my uncle, I remember my uncle like, yo, come on, I'm outside in town, I'll pick you up now. I've given him like 300 quid. And then he ends up giving me like 20 pounds worth of heroin. You know, and I didn't know, and I'm like, that ain't, that ain't, that ain't that much. Yeah, it is, like, don't, you know, well, I'm just allowing it. You're doing it. Yeah, and then. Because he's an addict and all. Because he's an addict and all, and I don't think, you know, he was doing this to, to get his nephew on drugs. I think he's just a desperate guy as well, who, who, who you know, needs drugs when he needs them, sort of thing, you know. So, you know, that, that, that went on for about a year, and then I remember one time, I, I got sacked from a job, but I had a payout, and uh, I went on a bender for like five days. And I woke up on the fifth day just feeling different, like never felt like this, never had this feeling before where um, I had these really horrible, uncomfortable, cold sweats, shivers, the goosebumps. Was this the start of physical? Yeah, withdrawing. Where I've now smoked and put heroin in my body for five days continuously, I have now built up an opioid, an opiate, addiction and uh yeah yeah it was it was horrible it was fucking horrible you're from a close-knit loving family mm. all your life where are that what's going on with mum and dad mum and dad are, um Do they they, know? they're getting their suspicions they're going down the local because they have a drink they've got friends they're going down the local boozer i heard cullen's hanging around me Fucking so and so. Hey, I'm not too sure on Colin. If you, you know, my mum and dad, they don't want to believe it, but they're having their suspicions. They're asking me, what are you taking? And all that. And I'm just like, nothing, whatever, whatever. And they found out, they went on holiday and they come back off holiday one time and someone had told them, look, he's fucking, you need to have a word with your son. It's not weed you have to worry about. He's a fucking heroin addict. He's on heroin. And there was this big fucking uh, intervention I had. And I can't put it down to anything more closely, you know, admitting to my mum and dad that I'm a heroin addict at the age of 18, 19, was, uh, I can only imagine it's probably like, you know, someone coming out as gay mm. to his family maybe. That's, that's kind of how it felt like, like I was embarrassed. I just like, I couldn't believe, like I've, I felt like I let him down and stuff. And What was their reaction? Um, total chaos like freaking out like just didn't know what to do didn't know where to turn like just didn't never heard of never thought this of this and like you know um a lot of like searching on google i think a, a lot of ringing Anthony, my uncle what's this what's this what's happening with him you know but it was even though it was blatantly obvious why i was using and who i was using with he never had that confrontational argument with him till years on you know didn't want to believe it. Yeah. Didn't want to accept it. Didn't want to accept he it. He loves you and loves his brother, I guess. Yeah. Didn't want to accept that his brother's done that to his own son. Because I'd kill my brother if, he, if I had a brother and he got my child addicted on heroin. Or even let him near it. Yeah. I'd probably want to kill him, but I've not been in that position to know that. Because mm. you also would love him. Yeah. Hmm. So this is the age of, what, 19? And you're smoking, but you're not injecting? Not, not injecting. So how, how are you funding this? So I put my addiction into five, five, two categories. Yep. First five years, second five years. First five years was total desperation. I didn't, you know, like I said, I was a spoiled kid. Yep. You know, I'd done the odd Christmas time jobs, working in kitchens, but I wasn't a money maker. You know, I wasn't a natural, I'm a natural talker, but I wasn't someone who was grafting. Yep. You know, I wasn't, you know, buying crates of Red Bull and selling them 50p in school. I wasn't that guy. Yeah. So to make money, I was a bit like, so for the first, you know, year or two, it was kind of borrowing money off people and just kind of swindling. And then it went to just like, um, opportun you know, an opportunist, you know, and that's when I started to really start to get a bit of a name and people not like me and not trust me. 
because phones would go missing off the side and okay. you know I, I I was I was that guy like do you know what I mean desperate uh, sleeping with girls waking up in the morning their phone's gone their wallet's missing <laughs> I was that guy <laughs> oh, fuck you. I was that guy man and uh, like t- even to a point which is just crazy but I slept with this girl and I knew she was batshit crazy psycho like you know got a past and stuff known to the police and stuff and uh, I slept with her my mate was like she's got the new it was, it, it was just before iPhones it was like a Sony he was like she's got the new Sony and I was like yeah yeah I'm gonna get it like and I took it we went to that you've only gone thing. to fuck her Don't, to get the phone yeah we well I fucked her and then he like he's come in the bedroom like she's got the new thing like you know and uh, I fucked off Gone back to the flat thinking, like, she's you know, not going to say anything. Note on the door, I've gone to the police and all that. I guess arrested the next day for fucking rape. She's gone and told them I raped her and all that. Yeah, oh, I swear that to you. pissed off for you. That pissed off for me. I've gone down there, like, they've had to swab me. I've, like, I'm doomed. I'm going to jail for life for rape and all that. And uh, I had no favor action. They went, listen, she's known for this, but like, you need to take this as a lesson. You're stealing people's phones and stuff. After having sex with Yeah, and I, I actually had to go to court for the mobile and she lied and said it was on the new iPhone, but it was this Sony thing. I remember that. But like, you know, just getting myself in shit like that. And then what happened was I started to go around unis and stuff, universities, mm-hmm. and uh, pretend I was a lost student and black people for many. Okay. Yeah. I was never like, I was never a beggar who would sit there and like, can mm. I have 50p? I used to look down on those people, actually, which is really sad, because I was just as bad as them. But I used to go around, like, Traforest, Bristol, Bath, Into the Cardiff. uni, same what? Oh, I don't know if you can help me, but I've lost my, I've lost my rail card. I'm trying to get back to my uni halls. Okay, and yeah. at the time, I looked really smart. I used to put on an accents and stuff, Canadian accents yeah. and fucking American accents. And, um, yeah, like, I used to make, Good money doing it, like 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 I'm not I'm not like asking for pounds and stuff. I'm asking for a twenty eight pound ticket or a fifteen pound ticket, and you know, oh, I ain't got fifteen. I got years of fiver. You know, I'd be making hundreds a day doing that. And for that first five years, I never went to prison or nothing, you know, because I wasn't hating it. I was, you know, I was stealing of people yeah, yeah. and lying, but I wasn't like physically robbing people. I wasn't doing any of that, and then. I got with this uh, got with this girl from the valleys, uh, and she used to drive me everywhere. And that's when I discovered uh, shoplifting. shoplifting. What me? Uh, I I started on meat, like you know that you know. I think uh, most people, if you think of someone who uses drugs and then a shoplifter, you will think, oh yeah, bits of meat. And to be honest, you like people laugh at it like it's the it's the biggest money maker. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, if you fill your car up with meat, you're never gonna worry about you know not not selling that meat. Mm. Um, but you know, it started at that I think, and it started locally. But then you know, as the years went on, like I I used to make thousands a day, travel the country, you know, and I was going, I was hitting it hard, 365 days of the year. Even if I've made a couple grand. I'm still going up the next day. Like, I, it, that was more of my addiction. To that? Yeah, you know, like, I, I, I was on a, I did an interview the other day on BBC Radio about, you know, the rise of shoplifting during Christmas. And I said, like, you know, I, I, I went up to film, um, I, went, I went to film a podcast in Kingston just before Christmas. And, uh, you know, I said, like, listening to the Christmas music on the motorway, Shit like that, it was triggering for me. Like, I, I thought I was pulling off to Bista. I thought I was going Bista Village on a race. And that's what you'd do. So, you were doing shops like Bista Village. I as was well. doing shops. Oh, yeah, that, you know, like, that's what I'm saying. Like, the meats and our like, desperation. Maybe yeah, that's, if I that's wake real up and, low level cracking. Yeah, like, like, I ain't doing that. Like, I have done it. Like, I'm not going to lie. I've nicked cheese. I've nicked milk. I, not milk. I've nicked cheese. I've nicked fucking steaks. I've nicked batteries. You know, I've nicked Ambi Pure plugins. I've done those things. But, I, I was more like up there, you know. I had the, the taggers, the clothes, you know. I, I you know, I, I, I never, I never paid for, for food. I never paid for clothes, and everything was sh- raising, and I was good at it. 
You know, I was, you know, I, I've been to jail ten times. By the way, you'd probably think I wasn't good. <laughs> yeah, but uh, all for shoplifting. All for shoplifting. Well, I'd say four or four or five are probably recalls. Talk to me about the first time you went to jail. Then, how old are you? I'm 23. So you made it to 23, being a heroin addict for five years without hitting prison. Yeah. And then you get to 23. What happens? You know, I was the. You know, you think you have nine lives. You know, you have your suspended sentences. You have your fucking tags your drug rehabilitation or others. And I never ever thought I'd go to jail for shoplifting. Shoplifting, I'm going to jail. And uh, you know, you've got to be kidding me, you know? And uh, I remember when I, you know, the first time I went, they gave me 12 months for shoplifting. 12 months, wow. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like and I'm going in there and I'm telling the screws, they're like, what are you in, 12, what are you in for? I'm in shoplifting. And they're like, what? And I'm feeling like I've been out done by. They're like, he's got four weeks for shoplifting. <laughs> I'm feeling out done by, and I did, but it was because of the sheer volume that and you'd been doing the volume previous, the, pro, the you know the, the value, and going out of your city, so you're, you're premeditating it then, and you was okay. conspiracy really, you know, and you know I've I've had times where it, you know I, I actually it was shoplifting, but they tried getting me done for commercial burglaries and stuff because, you know, I've uh, the shop, because I had this guy from a co-op who was a aerial manager and he used to leave the back doors open for me. So I'd go around the back and take all the trolleys of alcohol. But because I've gone in there, like it's a commercial, is the class yeah, yeah, as a burg. Yeah. I'm just shoplifting, you know, yeah. going behind the till, taking all the fags. I'm yeah. shoplifting. But yeah, yeah. it's a burg because you've gone behind the till. That's okay, yeah. what they're saying, you know. Uh, some stuff like that I would you know and I was getting 12 months 10 months 8 months but the first time I ever went to jail I cried mate I fucking Which cried show? so I was I done a rattle in there as well so so my first what's second, a rattle for people who don't know so a rattle is is when you go cold turkey off heroin which I um, don't do anymore they give you substitutes well you can you can still rattle if okay. you choose to okay um so I, I had to do the rattle. So I was on a methadone script. So I was one of those addicts that was just a gannet. You know, I wanted to be on methadone just because it was another buzz. It wasn't because I wanted to get off drugs. I could have my methadone and I can still use on top, you know? So that, that's, at that age anyway, that's what, you know, towards the end, it was more to help me. But at the beginning, it was like, well, well I can get something for free. It'll make me feel the way I want to feel. And I can use drugs on something before I want. Get me on it. You know, so um, I was on about 80 mil of methadone. And in Wales at the time, if you miss three days pickup of your methadone, um, it could, because it's such a strong drug, if you miss three days and you go into prison, they won't put you back on a methadone script because you could be lying and your tolerance, if you, okay, so if you were it, lying, you imagine you've never been on methadone, but you, you know, we know there's loads of people who get on heroin in prison because mm -hmm. just to take the walls away, mm -hmm. yeah? So imagine, you're like, oh, I'm on, I'm on meth. You give him meth and he dies because mm -hmm. it's so strong. So, you know, I miss three days meth, you know, if you miss three days, you, uh, you, you won't go on it. And I was on 90 mil of methadone. I was, on, I was on the run. And this is, you know, something I campaign and talk about a lot is these police, they all wait at drug clinics for people who are wanted, which I think is disgusting. Like these people are coming to get their medication, but now they're not gonna get their medication because they're scared you're gonna be there. And they're only for low level things. Like, do you know what I mean? If it's murder, I get it, you know, but, 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 but shoplifting, where you're gonna, you're not, you know, let him get his meth, find him somewhere else, stop waiting outside this fucking pharmacy, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, the police were looking for me quite a lot, so I couldn't go home, I couldn't go to the clinic. so. I just started buying methadone off the streets until I got caught. Mm. Guess caught, I goes in there. I've gone in there, I didn't know this rule at the time. I've gone to the meds, Arch, can I have my meth? No, you're not on the system. I am. Oh, you, you're on the system, but you haven't been here for a week and a half. Yeah, well you can't be on methadone. And, and, and that's what happened. So, and, and for people who don't know, methadone is harder to come off than heroin. That, which is what they subscribe to everyone now in jail. Hey, mate, when they say meds, the whole place gets up and the walk, meth queue. walks like this. <laughs> yeah. I swear to God, it's, uh, it's like something I've never seen. Get your meth, well, lads. Get, get your meth. I was sitting there like, methadone. what's going on? Where's everyone going? Everyone's going to get their drugs. I said, yeah. what do you mean they're going to get their drugs? So <laughs> everyone's getting given drugs, like the whole jail. 
It's, it's, it's a fucking meth. It's a meth. No, well, like, not everyone's on meth, I don't think. No, but the majority of the jail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're meds. They shout meds. Meds, yeah. Meds yeah. where you get your meds. But most people go and get substitutes for, for drugs. Yeah, well, 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 well you know, someone could be on sertraline. Someone yeah. could be on fucking... They're legally giving them it. Yeah. And, and they're coming out hooked on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, which is just a legal well, substitute Well, this is what I'm saying. It's changed back to it now that... Say, like you just said, oh, look, I've been sniffing Sebi in here. Yeah. You might have only had one line. They'll give you a piss there. Say, yeah, he has been. And they'll put you on a method on the script. Before but you people go, are only going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you're like, so then they're giving you a prescription. You go in each week and get your errand. It's backwards. And I'll talk to you about that yeah, in a minute. Yeah. Like, it's, it, like, obviously, I work in Because it shocked me all that. Yeah. When I was in jail, I just saw, what's <laughs> going on here? And everyone looks like zombies, man. <laughs> Everyone's zombieing up to get their. Fun. Yeah, you see people queuing up before it's even queuing open. Queuing up, they've just all, and you all know, they've done is they've yeah. put the whole prison on legal prescribed yeah, drugs. Yeah. They don't want to drive it into jail. No, there's no, there's no attempt to solve the addiction issue. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. So my dad's fuming about it's, it. Like it's, it's insane to watch. Well, on that sentence, on that first sentence, like you're gonna laugh. This cool. is what happened. So I'm in there now, first ever time in jail. I'm fucked on the bed. I can't even stand up, right? And to be in jail, you need to be on job, like, don't you? You know, like, I, I've got nice trainers on, I've got my tobacco, I've got fucking whatever else I've got, yeah, Not right? For long. <laughs> you could easily get him taken off you, because I couldn't defend myself. If I had a beef with someone in there from outside, like, I'm getting wrapped up. Um, luckily, because of my name, Mace, people were coming to my cell, yeah, was that me? Oh, they think it's Macy, my uncle, isn't it? But it's not. But, um... I was like, you know, I was in there and I found out I couldn't be on meth, but they still put me on the drug wing. So because I was detoxing, they put me on the drug wing. So everyone's on meth <laughs> and I'm not, which was even more torture because I'm like, they're all off their faces and I'm fucking clucking. So what happened was they, 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 I was going to the meds hatch for these things called brittle effects, which lowers your heart rate to help you stop your cluck, they say. But people were coming up to me and saying, if you keep your brittle effects, keep your brittle effects back. And we'll I'll give you some subby. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's trading drugs. But where I, I, but where I was out of it, where I was out of it, I've gone and just walked off and they've gone, palm in. And they caught me palming, you know? What's palming? Palming your meds. Oh, okay. Mm. First time in, I haven't got a clue. Off my face. Yeah. So I thought, okay, yeah, he's got me palming. Next day, slip through the door, TV taken, you're on basic. <laughs> I'm rattling on my first ever time on basic. Yeah. They pushed me over to F Wing on, on, on one of the main wings. Which house is in? Cardiff. Cardiff, I guess. They pushed me onto F Wing, which is the second biggest wing. And just bare people. I'm just seeing. And you're all funny in jail. You just see the most randomest people. People you know. You could be anywhere in the country and you'll see someone you know yeah. or they know of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like, what are you in here? Like, you know, anyway, I guess, put, I guess took him down into this room. Uh, and one of the boys knows I'm rattling, he's got tramadols, he's got subbies. He looks after me a little bit and I'm thinking, fucking no, this is a bit better actually. Anyway, I guess two that my mate Khaled's off, but who I grew up with. So we're there, we're chatting, I'm thinking, do you know what? It's I can right, do 12 I months in here. I can do 12 months in here, right? I'm here for two days. Bam, slip comes through my door. Yellow slip. You fit the criteria of an overcrowded prisoner. Cullen Mace, you were being shipped to Birmingham. Winston oh, Green. Oh <laughs> First ever sentence, right? I'm being shipped to Birmingham. Oh I'm like, man. I'm not going. I'm not going. They're like, you're going. My mate's going, swallow some razors. They, they want to yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, they pull the razor out. That's what people do. Swallow the razors and, and then they're not allowed to move you. Yeah, yeah. I said, mate, I'm not doing that. You know, I'll end up fucking literally swallowing them or something, you know. And uh, well, they just sit there saying, I'll cut myself. Yeah. They come, move, try and move me. I'll cut I remember watching a boy yeah. in the cell. Move me, I'll cut myself, bro. And they still, they got him in the, the van. And no, they, they will, they don't then, care. Then they had to bring him back. That's probably an old, yeah. Old then they had to bring him back. And he's like, wait, I'm fucking it's mad. It's mad, day, Everyone's it? cheering at that. It's fucking it's mad, It's a strange it? place. It's fuck. a strange place. Joe, this lad, this lad I'm on about. So I was down on solitary, so I was down the block. This is in Onley. And he, he'd been there eight weeks. And I said, what are you in here for? He goes, I smashed up my cell. I said, why have you smashed up my cell? Why did you smash up my cell? He goes, because I'm addicted to spice. He goes, and I get out, I've got another four weeks, I've got three months to get out. I don't want to go out of I don't want to leave prison of drug addicts, yeah? I look a mess, I haven't had a visit for a year because of the drug addiction. So the only way I can get away from the spice is to be down here. So I've smashed it up and made sure they put me down the block. So every extra time, days. It get extra, but every time they're coming to get him, he's like, I ain't going nowhere. So he just said, I'm staying here till I get out of that prison wall, because that's how much he doesn't want to be on drugs. Wow. But that's it. But he's having I said, mate, because I'd been that I said, 
you're, you're willingly, you can go up on the wing now, have your TV, have your normal food, have your normal regime. You're solitary in yourself. He goes, I, I don't wanna be on, I don't wanna be on Spice Bro. And it's everywhere. I was like, what a sad state of affairs that this lad is, that, is having, what to, it's do, like, mate. He's having to do that. Pe people go in, you know, they go in on purpose. You know, I, I know people who will go in routinely. Parceled up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do their fourteen day lie downs because yeah. they get a bit of money, they get free drugs, yeah, yeah. and they get their free meal. And rather than be out there tapping. I see one in Winchester. The lad didn't want to leave. He was crying when it comes to him leaving. He's only like twenty eight. Yeah, it's, Been in it's there fucking since he was crazy. A kid. It's sad. It's, uh, you know what's funny about JL? Have you ever sat on an exercise yard and just watched people's trainers? No. Some of the fucking kicks they got <laughs> on, mate. It's, fu it's funny, mate. It yeah. is funny. Some characters in there, mate. Mm. But yeah, so they, 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 they shipped me to Winston Green. And then when I was in the meat wagon, and this is what I'm saying about it's backwards, they went, you know we're going to an English jail, innit? He went, you're rattling, innit? I said, yeah. He said, you know in England, they put you straight on meth. I said, fuck off. I've done two weeks now. I've done two weeks rattling. Yeah. I'm halfway there. What do you think I've done? Got meth. You've got on the meth. But this is where I fucked up. So I goes in there. Have you ever been to Birmingham? No, nah, man. Oh, Thankfully, my God, mate. I don't think honestly. I'd be sitting next to you if I went to Birmingham, bro. Mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For you, I'd yeah. I'd be dead, mate. It's, um, it's, it's not a nice jail, mate. It's old. Um, it's not a Victorian jail. Yeah, the induction room is like really like small ceilings. It's weird. And... Uh, you know, like the that's, tourist that's attraction, the tourist attraction. This is Fred West cell. There's a cell there okay. which is obviously condemned. You know, they've 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 kept it like as if like he was a great man. It's fucking backwards, isn't it? <laughs> this is Fred West cell. You're like, okay. <laughs> you know, uh, turn it into something else. I when I was in um, Belmarsh and uh, what's his name, Ross Kemp, come in. He said, Do you know who's been in this this room here before you? I said, who? He said, Ian Huntley. This is called the Huntley Suite. I went, fuck off. Ian Huntley killed two kids. I asked the paedophile how he felt about his verdict. What the fuck? That's just what is going on? That's bad. That's weird. What is going on? Why am I saying? How ironic but is yeah, that? Yeah, mad, mate. How ironic. So the paedophile was in that cell, yeah. and you're questioning a paedophile. And I'm putting the cell. So I, the pe they, built, they built it specifically. It's called the Huntley Suite. That's what they called it. So they it was built specifically it. for him, so no one can ever get near him. So then when I come into jail, they put me there. So I'm totally on my own. If I had someone visit, they come and visit me in the cell next door. So wow. it's all on one unit. I, basically, the idea is I don't need to leave this little bit so no one's going to get a chance to kill wow. me. So I was safe, but I said the sheer fact that the, the, the previous man that had to be under these circumstances killed two little Would girls. you go? Would you go on a... Would you go, like... Oh, would you want to go on a... Yeah, I, I, did, I, did, I did every time I went in jail until they forced me. So I did in Woodhill. I got battered. I did in Peterborough. I got uh, 24 hours in police custody. There's a, there's a, I, I, on the documentary, I was fighting on the wing there. I did in Winchester. I had a good sentence in Winchester. I was sound in Winchester. I come out of my cell um, and lads had my back in Winchester because it's not a, the Muslims have not got control of where's that jail. The, where's that to? Winchester's like down next to Portsmouth. Wow. Southampton area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. it's not massively populated yeah. with Muslims. Yeah, yeah. So there were Muslims in there, but not enough to control but the But it's prison. still surprising because he, it don't matter where they're from. Like, normally they would be shipped everywhere, wouldn't they? Yeah, they are shipped everywhere. But as I said, on my wing out of well, that's good, 100 man. prisoners, there might have been seven, ten. So there's not enough of them yeah. to be able to control the place. Yeah, 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 I understand. So, yeah, in each jail I went to, yeah, obviously I'll shit myself every time I'll go into any one of them. Yeah. I've got to go through that first, same process when I get in there of either fighting Bedford. I was on the main wing in Bedford. I ended up fighting in there instantly in the canteen. Because um, me, it's a fight for survival. I don't have an option to wait. It's either hit or be hit. Yeah. Yeah, and it is. It's so, and, that, and that Birmingham, obviously, being Birmingham, a very you know a, a very multicultural mm. city, it, it was. And you see, you see a lot of converts, reverts, whatever you want to call it. Like it, you you don't know who, who, who you don't know who's who in there. When I was like, in Woodhill and they get prayers, I remember sitting watching when I was up at the visits, and the majority of them were not Asian, Pakistani. Yeah. The majority of the Muslims were white and black. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. But, but, but it's a thing, it was for a long time a thing, innit? Become Muslim and you're, you're treated better. You're treated you better, you've got protection, you food, no one's going to hurt you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's actually funny because my uncle, he used to say, uh, people would laugh, right, but we found out that the best food to have is, is say you was Jewish, you get kosher food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're not even Jewish, obviously, like, yeah. but uh, that's the food we used to get, these kosher meals and stuff, and they, they were really nice, actually. Mm. But everyone said, oh, become Muslim and you'll get the Muslim food. 
But it's the same food. It's just on Ramadan you they get, get annoyed, they get, get curries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's the only difference. But yeah, I went to Winston Green and uh, I went on. So when I was in there, I'm here with no. Listen, this wings man, this wings man, whatever, whatever, whatever. And uh, I remember like, I, I just got on the methadone. I just couldn't handle this clerk. Although I was two weeks in, I was still struggling really bad. So I went back onto methadone in there. And, you know, because I hadn't been on it for two weeks, I was having a nice little buzz, no worries. And uh, they went, right, mate, B-wing. Because I was on methadone, I have to go on a methadone wing. So they go, B-Wing, Mace. And then I remember this big black guy, right, who seemed, when we were on induction, everyone was like quite respectful of this guy. He seemed like people were shook of him. He's going, where are you going? I went, B-Wing. He went, oh, mate, good luck. I said, why? You mean that's the worst wing in the jail? <laughs> I'm thinking, if this big guy here is telling me it's the worst wing, how bad is it, yeah? So um, I went there, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a fucking shit all, mate. Honest to God. It was, it was the old side of the jail, so it was stinking. The cells were absolutely disgusting. Cockroaches? Cockroaches, yeah. And I, like, I, remember, I remember walking in on the wing, like, and that was the first, like Cardiff was, uh, you know, was a big wing, but I'm in my city. When I walked onto that wing in, on B-Wing in Birmingham, like, the feeling of just everyone watching you, like, all eyes Why on you. Why being me, bro? I can imagine, <laughs> I can imagine, this is what I'm saying. It was wild, mate, yeah, okay. right? And like, I remember getting on the phone to my old man and saying, oh, how the fuck did I deserve this? Like, you know, Birmingham, can't be dispersal. I'm a fucking, I'm in for my first shoplift, you know? So um, anyway, I guess two up with this guy from Stoke and this traveler kid come up to me and he went, do you want to meet your mates? I said, what do you mean my mates? He took a liking to me, this traveler. He thought I was traveler at first for some weird reason. And he goes- uh, Did you have the hat on in jail? <laughs> no, no, no. But he goes, what family are you? I went, the bases. <laughs> like as if he knew my family, like, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, I, when you're not a traveller, I went, no. Oh. He went, do you want to meet your other mates? I said, who? He went, you're Welsh boys. I went, it's Welsh people here. He went, come with me. He took me upstairs and <laughs> there's like five landings. It's fucking massive B-Wing Birmingham. And uh, he took me into this cell and when he opened the door, it was like being back in Wales. It was mad. It was all these mad tappings here talking yeah. and that. And they shut the door on me and he went, listen, they could see it was my first time, you know, baby face as well. And they were like, listen, you'll see things in this jail that you'll see nowhere else. And I'm like, what the fuck are they saying? He, and they went, listen, it's mad in here. He said, the screws, they don't even care. He said, like, if you're having it, was like, they're not even coming for you. Mm -hmm. That's how bad it was in there. The screws would just lock the door and sit in an office, yeah, the association. It's done. It's done. And it's, this jail is massive. This wing is massive. <laughs> like, it reminded me, like, you know, like, um, you see those films when they're walking down at like a Broadway, you know, people's in their doorways with their fags and that, and it's just different walks of life everywhere, and it was different gangs on all these different landings. It was massive. And uh, the one kid went to me, yeah, he went, I've been here for four months, I've seen five people killed on you. And you don't hear that on the news. Five people on one wing in one jail. No, no, you you never hear any of that stuff. You never hear got, anyone. Someone got beheaded in Woodhill. Beheaded. Beheaded in Woodhill prison. Where's that on the news? You don't hear it. Fucking beheaded, bro. Wild, isn't it? Mm. And uh, yeah, so they, you know, they were saying there was a lot of suicides in there, a lot of trouble. Um, and he went, do you take visits? I said, well, I won't, but my mum and dad will come to see me, yeah. And my missus. They went, try to avoid it. I said, why? I haven't seen them. He went, he said, in here, people are coming back off visits who don't even have stuff and they're getting put on the toilet. Like, people were like, willingly going out of their way to look at the visit list every morning, see who's on a visit, and let's just pressure him, let's see if he got anything. And that's what was happening. People were put, oh, so people put on the toilet with a knife. When say so people put on the toilet, when they come, you're, you might go visit your mum and dad, and when you come back, other lads in the jail think you've got drugs. Yeah. So they're and you're getting toilet, fucked up. Making you, yeah. Some of them, they're putting, sp 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 I've putting seen spoons people, in yeah. your bum. Open, I, grabbing them. Stick, stick my mate got a big payout not long ago. He, he, and he, he's no dickhead. He got spooned. He got spooned. And he's no dickhead. But he got spooned by boys who knew him. It was bad. Like, yeah, stitches, him up, pulled everything. his pants down. Stitches. Opened up his ass yeah. for drugs. Ruthless. You know, and uh, that was in Cardiff <laughs> twice. Don't uh, go to prison, kids. No, no, don't. Just, you know, pe pe I love it when people say, yeah, j jail's easy. Jail's easy. <laughs> Fuck off, mate. Well, they're listening to some rapper rap about it. Yeah, and it's, it's not easy, mate. And it's, 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 it's the worst environment you can ever be in. You just can't switch off. You're 100% on alert. Yeah. And you've got to be in with someone who you are 
cert not certified, but you've got to have some sort of trust with this guy because yeah. you can't even trust your pad mate. No, of course not. You, how many times have you heard about people pad mates killing his pad mate because yeah. he fucking, I know, never breathed the wrong way? No, I know you wouldn't, but you know, you, you, you hear that like, do you know what I mean? It's, it, it is bad. So I was in there for a couple of weeks and then I heard my name call again. Mace, Stoke Heath. And they took me to Stoke Heath then up in uh, Shropshire where I spent the rest of my time and I actually enjoyed it. And and this is what I say, like even at that time I was leaving and people were like, is this your, is this, you know, is this your first time in jail? And I used to say, this is my only time. It's not my first time, it's my only time. Because I was adamant that I was never going back to jail again. But, you know, I, I went another 10 times, 11 times after that, like, you know. Uh, did but you get clean when you was in jail? I was in, so out of the times I've been, I've been clean about four months in total. Because the majority of times I was either on methadone or mm. I was sniffing Serbi or I was, you know, I was tooed up with my uncle on one of them and we were getting parcels in and we were smoking. So like only once or twice, you know. But every time I did want to come out and, and, and change. But I just fell straight into that, 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 uh, that cycle again. I remember that first time I came out, my missus waited at the gate for me and stuff. She booked a nice hotel, the Vale Hotel, which is a nice one in Cardiff. And, uh, you know, we went shopping and we were on our way. And as we left, I said, listen, love, turn right, I've got to go see Big Z, which was a guy who uh, knew, where to get, knew where to get things. And she was like, oh, please, Carl, what are you doing? And I was like, listen, I'm not at peace with it. I, I was on the run, I got caught. I didn't have that one last hurrah, you know? And that's how I used to justify. feel with it all the time. Just one more just, go. You justify Just it. one more smoke, you know? And it's never one more because although we had an RI night, probably tainted by me smoking crack in the fucking hotel with a sock on the, on the smoke, smoke alarm, but, you know, I just went every day then smoking. And then I think... Off that first one, it was only eight months later, and I was back in jail. And those breaks of how long I was in for and how long I was out for, the sentences got longer, the time out got shorter. And it just got worse and worse and worse. Until? So what happened? What's the defining... Because people say you have to hit your low. You yeah. Have, you have to yeah. hit the lowest of your low, and who knows what that person's low is. No one knows, do they? No because... Knows. You know, my your success is different to my success and your low is different to my low. Yeah. You know, I thought jail might have been my rock bottom. It wasn't. I thought going to rehab might have been. I thought being rushed to hospital might have been. I thought breaking up with my missus might have been. I've, you know, none of, of these was never my rock bottom. Was you injected at this point? So I've, I've injected a few times, but it was never my, uh, it was never my go-to. Okay. Because, which is lucky, I'm petrified of needles. I'm going to, being finished if I did like them because the first time I tried it I was already like I said earlier about the coke and then taking the crack I was writ off on heroin all day anyway and I had it and I didn't know what I was looking for I was like is that it because I was already off my face yeah. I think if I didn't have any that day and I was clucking and then had it and had that feeling maybe I would have got addicted but luckily I, I, I never so I only injected a, you know, a handful of times so it was always smoking but that's what led to my demise. So lockdown came and, uh, you know, at this time... Was that how recently you were doing drugs? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? Yeah, fucking hell. I, I've that's achieved really a lot. Sure. Yeah, I know. Wow. Yeah, so, so what happened was lockdown came and, uh, you wow. know, I was making two, three grand a day, me and my partner, Good you know, shoplifting. Okay. Uh, We'd split, I'd split, I split the minis with my drivers. So what a lot of addicts don't realise, and that's why they end up just being stuck on their estate, going to their local shop every day, is because they're tight. <laughs> you know, I would, if they did get someone who would drive them, they would probably wouldn't make much, and they'd probably say, you are here's a tenner for petrol. But I always give my drivers half. I'd fill up their tank as well, that's separate. I'll fill your tank up, and I'll give you half of what I make. So... What I had then was just a long list of people who would beg to take me out. Because it's hard. When you, if you're an addict and you don't drive, it's hard for someone to take you out raising. Of course. But I'd have my phone constantly blowing up. Let me take you tomorrow. Let me take you tomorrow. 
but I had one or two people who I was with all the time and we knew what we were doing. So, um, you know, I pay my drivers half and I was making big money. So lockdown came. At this time, I was ready to change my life. I didn't know, I thought I was always going to die at 28 anyway. But in, at the same time, I thought I would like to change my life. I don't want to be this person anymore. Like, I fucking hate it. Like, I've never been on a boy's holiday. My mum and dad don't believe a word I say. I've got no mates. All I've got is people, you know, I smoke with. Yeah? I've got, you know, I've built up a close relationship with the person who drives me around shoplifting. But that's it. I've got no mates. You know, I am fucking lonely. And, uh, you know, like, my reputation is just stay away from him. He's probably got hep C, HIV, AIDS. He's an heroin addict. He's a junkie. You know, girls. And, and for a long time, I never had problems with girls or nothing. Like, you know, I was... You know, I was shagging and, you know, I was still with girls, even though I was on heroin. But that was getting, like, the standards were getting lower and lower. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I'm deteriorating. And, and my body was when as well. When you say deteriorating, you looked fucking awful. Man. Yeah. So I got, I did a rattle the one time. I went up to my lands up in Corby. Corb well, I went to Catherine. And, I was going to say, uh, I, the wrong place to go to get off heroin. Well, welcome to hell, man. It's fucking, fucking mad up It's there, everywhere. Mate. So my nan, my nan, they grew up on Glastonbury Road, which is Beanfields, so the Phoenix pub, uh, Beanfields Estate, uh, Corby. And uh, they moved to Catherine, some of them did, and Gaddin turned them all around there. So, so I, I went to Catherine and got done a rattle, well, I was meant to, but within the first two minutes of being there, <laughs> as my dad's unloading the car with all my stuff and I'm fucking rattling, I see this guy. Now, you know, especially as an addict, and I'm sure you, we all do, we, we identify when someone's a user, don't we? You know, without being rude. Uh, and I pulled this guy and he went, yo, 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 can you get me any things? And he's looking at him, I'm like, who's this guy with a weird accent? I went, can you get me any things? He's going, who are you? I went, listen, my nan lives here, 35, I'm fucking rattling, right? I'm coming up here to do a club, can you get me anything? He, he went like that, he went, come here, and they were in the terrace house. In terraced houses. He went, come here. He took me in the doorway. He pulls out a rap like that. He's the main dealer of Catherine. Oh you know, God. he's the main dealer of Catherine. He's got about 100 wraps of crack, 100 wraps of heroin. He went, what you want? I was like that. Get in there. I had a bit of cash on me. I bought about 10 of each. No, I never bought 10 of each. I bought about 10 and 5. Uh, goes upstairs like that. My dad's gone, go on, go up, go and do your thing now. Like, my. He's dropped all my stuff. They're going back to Cardiff. They disown me at this point. They don't want me in Cardiff. My nan's like, go on. My, 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 my nan love her. Like, she's a fucking legend. I need to go up and see her now I do. Like, because, you know, she, I don't think she's got long left. But um, she was like, go on, Peter. Go on. I'll look after him now. Just, just go. So for the first week, I'm upstairs, booting, just flat out, not leaving the room. She thinks I'm doing a rattle. You know, every bringing me some food up and, you know, Colin, your dad's on the phone. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm all right. He's doing well. He's doing well. And I'm just flat out smoking. And then when I ran out of stuff, yeah, I went downstairs and admitted it to my grandmother. I went down, listen, I'm fuck I've been smoking upstairs. I'm so sorry. Like, I, I can't lie to you. What do you think she done? This is all like old school and like, you know, she's been through with Auntie and all that as well. You know, she, all this stuff like... Proper old school Scottish Scottish woman, like good as gold, and I like, do you know what I mean? She's like, right then. She's like, phone, phone the dealer. I goes, what? She went, did you take his number? I went, yeah. She went, phone him. I said, why? She went, bring him here. She phones the dealer. She went, right, this is what we're gonna do. She went, here we go. What's your name? His name was Soggy. She went, Soggy, here we go. There's my card. Go to the shop and drop me 150 quid out. He's gone. Okay. It was wrong. She lived on a terrace, and the corner shop was literally there. Comes back with 150 quid, trusted the guy to come back with it. He comes back, he went, she went, right, what can I get with 150 quid? He went, uh, 20, 20, 20 reps, 20 tens. She went, I'll have the 20 tens. She went, right now, thank you very much for this. I really appreciate it. We're going to go now and we're not going to speak to you again. He went, oh, yeah, no worries. He left. She went, right, what we're going to do is, today you're going to have a bag, tomorrow you're going to have half a bag, we're going to do it like that. Do you know what I mean? That's what she tried doing. Like, for two, three days, we'd have a bag. Then for two, three days, you'd have half a bag. And then you'll have 
a quarter of a bag. And that's what she tried doing for me, my nan, like, do you know what I mean? And I just, what you've got to realise is, as an addict, especially with heroin, you've just got to stop dead, mate. You can't be playing, like, mm. dabbling and all that. It'll never work. No. You're just, and I was just taking my nan for a ride. You know, with alcohol, it's different. Yeah, you you know, can't just stop dead with alcohol. No, no, you can die. die. But with heroin... You can. The best way. It's the best way, man. And, I, you know, I took advantage of my nan up there. And, you know, I, I, I probably got a few girls pregnant up there. I had murder. I got jumped in trap houses up there. I was known as Wales. They fucking hated me. The boys up there. And, uh, yeah, it, it, I, I, I just run riot up there. Went back home. You know, and it was just the same thing again. But... What, 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 going back to, to what, what the final thing was, so lockdown came and I was flat out raising, my body was deteriorating, I had scabs all over me, I, I, I couldn't breathe, I used to, you know, my dad or my mum would wake up in the middle of the night trying to wake me up because they thought I weren't breathing, or if I was sleeping with a bird, she'd wake up in a panic thinking I wasn't breathing or I was making funny noises, I was waking up every morning spewing up this bile and all this black ash from all the crack I was smoking, you know, I wasn't burning the foil like they say you're meant to burn the foil before you smoke the heroin because of the pleurisy, the, the water that it gathers on your lungs. I weren't doing any of that. You know, why, why am I going to burn foil to make sure it's clean foil? I'm smoking heroin, you know? So I was just like not caring, not taking any harm reduction advice. I was just flat out. Um, lockdown came and everyone must have thought that because it's lockdown, you won't be able to make any money no more as a shoplifter. But... What people failed to realise was, you know, shops were still open, you know, essentials and stuff. And uh, for the first time ever, you was allowed to wear a mask and no one would question you wearing a mask. And, you know, also, everyone was paranoid. Everyone thought this was a real thing. This is contagious and, you know, stay away from me. So if I'm going in the shop now and I'm filling up a trolley with fucking alcohol... Because that's what I did during lockdown. I didn't go clothes shopping. They were shut. It was alcohol. And that was it. Be and I'll tell you why now. So when I'm filling up a trolley, these people are just like, oh, no, 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 just let him go, let him go. Don't chase him. He might have COVID, you know? So I was just smashing it. And during lockdown, that first lockdown, what was it like? The weather was banging. So everyone was just on the piss. Everyone yeah, was yeah, steaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everyone just wanted alcohol. So... During that time, I think I made more money than I ever did. When people thought, like, oh, it's lockdown, you ain't making no money, ha ha. Like, I was macking it. I was making thousands a day. Uh, sunglasses and all that. Specsavers was open. One at a time, one at a time. I was going and taking all the glasses. People, you know, COVID, this paranoid time that everyone was in. Everyone was just getting steamy. Get me a pair of Ray-Bans, you know? Just, it was mad, like a mad time. But the more money you make as an addict... The, the more you fun. take, mm. isn't it? You know, and I really started to uh, just, just, just plummet. And what happened was, uh, basically, my, 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 my friend, my close friend, my, 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 my driver, um, passed away. How? Well, we don't know really. Like, I think he had like an underlying issue apparently uh, with himself. And I think drugs and alcohol were in the mix as well. And he passed away. And the fucked up thing about it is, this very same day that he passed away, I got rushed to hospital as well and almost died. How did you know? How did you almost die? So. Did you both take the same drug at that time? He, he wasn't a heroin user. Oh, okay. He'd smoke crack, but so he wasn't a heroin what, user. What was you rushed to hospital for? So I found out about the news had been passing and it hit me like a, a tidal wave started getting jelly leg just felt really weak and I think all the drugs that I was abusing during that time when I found out about that I think it just knocked my immune system for six just caught it off guard and uh, I started getting these stabbing pains in my back like within minutes like someone was stabbing me in my back in my lungs you know, if I'm breathing, it's catching, it's really hurting. Mm. And I remember I was with this girl at the time and I was asking her to stand on my back. That's how bad it was. Mm. Rub my back, stand on my back. But it was just not going away. As an addict, 
we avoid doctors like the plague. I never went to a hospital. I never had a bad back. I never had a, I never had a headache for 10 years. I just self-medicated on heroin. But this time, I knew something was up and I rung the doctors there and then. They got me an emergency appointment an hour later. The woman said, you need to go to the hospital right now. But it was locked down and I was paranoid. And I was like, I don't want to go there. To be honest, I didn't believe in this COVID thing, right? Do you know what I mean? And I thought, I'm not going up there for them to keep me there for fucking 20 days. I'm a heroin addict. I need my drugs. She was like, listen, you need to go. We don't know what's wrong with you. Get up there. So I went up to Land Dock. They done some tests. They said, uh, it's just an infection on your lung. Take these antibiotics on your way. Goes home. I'm still in shock, you know. <laughs> Messages off people. Is it true? Is your mate that You know, I'm, I'm, I'm devastated. Uh, I has a boot before I goes to bed. I goes to bed. I wakes up at three in the morning. And I can only describe it like I'm lying in a... It's like I'm lying in a swimming pool. <laughs> My bed is soaking. It's like I'm on a water bed that's burst. Drink, I'm soaking, right? I'm boiling. I'm lightheaded. And I sit up. And as soon as I sit up, I can't breathe. I'm choking. I just... All I remember is crawling out of bed. Crawling out of bed. I'm living with my mum and dad at the time and I'm on tag. I crawls out of bed and I, I just must have had enough fucking breath in me to call my dad's name. Dad. That was it. I woke up two days later in the hospital with, um, they, you know, uh, needles. Yeah, dri it, drips in Drips in both arms, two in both arms, and an oxygen mask on. I'm in this room on my own. They're testing me for COVID and all that. Like, it's coming, it's coming back negative, negative. I'm like, what's wrong with me? And they're like, we're, we're not sure yet, but just, just, just please, like, we're doing tests, we're doing extra tests and whatever. And every half hour, I'm still getting this fucking stabbing pain in my back, really fucking bad. Finds out I, I've got pleurisy, so pleurotic pneumonia on my lungs. And whilst I was in there, I caught sepsis. So, You're lucky, mate. so what they were doing in there, they were, because the antibiotics in my arms wasn't budging the infection, they were taking me in this fucking room with this big fucking needle and trying to draw the infection out of the lung. And it just wasn't working. Like, it was fucking horrific. I was in there for weeks. And, uh, yeah, they, they said I was lucky to, to, to pull through. I remember they showed me the x-ray. Imagine that's like, my lungs there, and there's like a little black patch by there. And I goes, oh, so that's the infection there, is it? And he goes, no, that's the clean bit. That's the infection. You are fucked, like, you know? And I, I, it took me like two weeks to get out of the bed, because they were rolling me round everywhere. But when I was in that bed, I remember like talking to myself, and there was a time where I genuinely thought I wasn't gonna make it. And I promised myself, I, I, like, I'm not religious, but like I prayed to some sort of higher power and I was like, listen, please let me get out of this alive. And I promise that I will, I will never take drugs again. Like I promise I will do whatever I can. I'll just, you know, speak to people, tell people my story, be open and honest. Just please let me get out of this fucking, just get me out of this hospital, like alive. And then this like little nurse came in and, uh, I was still on methadone at the time. And he went, right, listen, I've spoken to the nurse and stuff, and they said, you can stay on methadone, but you're gonna have to have pickups every single day, including weekends for the rest of your life. Because obviously I've been abusing it, and you know, they were like, we're not doing this no more, it's dangerous. Um, or you can be part of this pilot, so a guinea pig, and you can be one of the first people in Britain to try this new drug which is called Bouvidal. And I'm like, well, what is it? And they're like, well, it's an injection you take once a month. Now, you know, here's me, conspiracy tinfoil, that guy over here. Like, I believe in, you know, at the time, forced vaccinations was a big thing. Mm. We're in the height of COVID. Well, the first people are going to wipe out are the junkies with this injection, <laughs> isn't it? You know, I, I didn't want to do it. And I remember there was a guy next to me who unfortunately passed away and the nurse. The nurse said, look around you, mate. He said, you're on respiratory ward, B7, Heath Hospital, National Hospital for Wales. And everyone around you is 70, 60 plus. You're 30. 
27. You're 20, 28, yeah. just turned 28 inside. Isn't that mad? I thought I was going to die at 28. At, uh, at 27, 28. And I was in there thinking I was dying at that age. He said, your insides are the same as these, if not worse. And if you leave here and go back on methadone and use again, you're going to die. And the guy said to me next to me, oh, just try it, just try it. The next day that guy died. And when he died, I made that decision. I, and do you know what? I didn't make this decision of like, yeah, fuck it, I'm going to try it and do it and change my life. I genuinely thought that in a week's time, I'm going to be back on meth. I, I thought, just let's give it a go for a week mm. at least, you know? Because you have a week's injection just to see how it is, and then you have the months. So I thought, I'll try the week. So I had a couple of days, he said, we won't put you on it yet. We'll put it on you when you leave. You have to go to the place to get it done. So I stayed in hospital for a couple of days, plucked up the courage. Um, when I left, they took me to this place. I had the injection, and three years later, I'm here chatting to you now, like it's changed my life. What did it do? What did the injection do? So, there's like... What did it do to heroin then? Did it stop your craving? Did it stop Yeah. You? If you injected heroin, what would happen? It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. Is that just heroin, or is that all drugs? So I thought... Oh no, opiates. Opiates. So I can't take cold no more. Like, if I snap my leg and they give me morphine, it won't work. <laughs> okay. But crack? I can still take crack. Okay. And we're seeing a rise in that now. So Where people are then getting Yeah, so, so I was that guy who... So you got drug users who were just pure gannets. They will take anything and everything. I wasn't that. I was... Heroin was my demon. I like crack. And they come hand in hand like coke and alcohol. So, you know, my treat was crack. But my... Go to... My next. life, my lifeline, my, my medication... My everything is heroin. So some people who are just like, they'll have anything. They'll buy like 10 whites and 10 brown. I'd buy 18 brown and two whites. Cause okay. So like I couldn't smoke crack on its own right. because I'll be... Needing that. Well, like the yeah, same yeah, as yeah, how yeah, I started yeah, yeah. it, I'd be all digi. So what I used to do is I'd have a pipe. <laughs> I'd enjoy the initial buzz and then I'd get the heroin and take it straight away. And people would be like, Cullen, why are you even taking crack? It makes you a weirdo, and you don't even like it. But it was just that was just the the, the Bobby and the Whitney that was just that they come hand in hand. So once I tackled my heroin addiction, it tackled, it tackled I killed two birds with one stone. And, and what's and how's life changed since that? Um, what's the bit? What's been the story since that? Mate, what has? Because you know, Tommy Robinson fighting on my <laughs> podcast. Haven't you now have the biggest podcast in in, in, in what, Wales? In it? Wales, yeah, definitely You're in the Wales. Biggest podcast in Wales. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, Your success story? Yeah, you know, I work full-time. as a, I'm a full-time drug worker. Um, the, my, my job title, I'm the co-production facilitator of South Wales. Uh, so I basically go around services in Cardiff and Vale, uh, Rhonda Valleys, uh, Bridgend, Merthyr, uh, and basically make sure that these services have representation of people who use them. So the people with lived experience, people who are on methadone, they have a say on how their services run. So I'm kind of like the voice for these people. Mm. It's a big job, like, you know, big, big gig. Like, I, I love it. Um, so, you know, I do a lot of public speaking. I go around uh, schools, unis, um, uh, prisons. Um, I do talks on Bouvardal in big, oh, big functions. Are they giving this Bouvardal to... All people now? So Wales it, Wales and Scotland, we, we're leading the way. England are now slowly picking up. I've done a Lad Bible interview. It was just meant to be about me being on heroin, a heroin addict, but I kind of swayed it to make it talk about Bouvardal because I feel it's an important thing to talk about. I think this needs to be... Why people like Piers Morgan ain't talking about this game-changing Because drug. this is game-changing for so many... It ends the crime, it saves the families. What? And that's the question that we need to ask, isn't it? Because I'm asking this question now in services. Is it? Expensive, is it? it is expensive, but it's a game-changer. And this is it why it saves money on the... It costs you 40 grand a year. But to then you've got to ask this question. Do they want these people off drugs in, in, in masses? No, because without not. the fucking crime, there's no prison staff, there's no police staff. There's, and this is what I hate, like... You've you know, we can I've gone down that rabbit, rabbit hole. hole. Because, because... They need, we, which we, is what IPP yeah, was about. Yeah, look, look, yeah, because what it's I think what IPP is, was about. Yeah. Guaranteed prisoners. Like, it's like, it's like, you know, what I say to people is we can change how society is run, but we can change individuals from falling into that trap. That's what I'm trying to do. 
I'm not going to change the, the, the world. I'm just trying to change individuals I know so they don't fall into that monster. Let me ask you this. What's it like with your dad since? Because the first time I met you, I met your dad. He seems very proud. He seems like a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a great dad. Mate, I, it's probably similar to, with you and your father. Like, uh, and you know what? It, it, it could have been bigger and better if, if I was never on drugs. But it's sweeter now. Um, you know, we, we're like best mates. Obviously, like, you know, I said my uncle was 10 feet tall. My dad was 50 feet tall. He, he is, he, my, he's my everything, you know. And, uh, is it great? That, are you happy that they've got to see where you're at now? Yeah, you know, my dad's getting older, man. Like, and I didn't, I didn't, want, I didn't want them to go thinking that their son is still well, ill. Know, yeah, yeah, and I, I see peace in them now, you know. And, it's, it, you know, people come up to me, their mates. They're like, Yo, your dad, he's a different man now. He's a different man, like, you know, because I did, like, you know, like, he didn't, ha he didn't, you know, like my dad and my mum, they're, they're good people, you know. They, they plan to have me and my brother. They wanted to have kids. They wanted to have a family. And, you know, for them to, for me to go down that road, is heartbreaking, isn't it? You know, like it's, it's it disgusting. It years of pain for them. Yeah, yeah, definitely, you know. And, you know, I'm just glad, like, you know, like the fact that he's come up here, like, he's like, yeah, I'll come. Like, you know, like he don't care. Like, is he just so happy? He'd rather me... You know, uh, he'd rather waste time on me driving up here to do an interview with you rather than drive around looking for me down the docks. And, and, to it's, see if po I'm and dead. it's positive what you're doing now because people say, say, say someone's watching this who's got a relative, a son maybe, who's hooked on heroin. They're going through everything your parents went through. What would you say to them? I'd say never give up to these. I, I would, I, like, it sounds cliche, but just don't give up. Hang in there, hang in there with them. My mother and father did. Uh, of course, there was times they washed their hands with me. You know, get the fuck out of the house and don't come back. And but then in two three weeks they you know they're ringing people about the machine color and they're worried. They you know, me. and they love me. And you know, like my dad used to say to me, he said, "Fucking, I know fucking people who'd be disowned for nicking a pound out of their fucking mum's purse." And they're right. You know, if you if you told me what were some of the worst things I'd done, mate, I saw my mum's engagement ring. Wow. You know, wow. I saw my mum's engagement ring. I still don't know if that's, that's as bad as. Fucking your mates miss it. <laughs> <laughs> but I got up, but like this is part of like probably part of my OCD, part of my bargain. Like where I said, like you know, if I get out, I'll be honest. Like I won't lie about anything. Like and I want people to know how low I was. You know, some people. This is what I'm saying. Like you say, like I can't believe that you was that bad and that, that long ago. You know, it was so recent. That's so recent. And from the first minute, oh, that's why I said I listened to your story first time. People don't know. Went and looked at your pictures and thought, "Fucking hell, man." Yeah, people don't know, man. It must like, be hard to come from that to get to where you're at. Uh, it has been hard, you For know. And, you know, and, and like you know, I, I never. I'm not your average recovery kind of like poster boy either like you know uh you normally see people who go through like 12 steps and aa and na yeah. that's not me like do you know what i mean and, and is, in na i probably great, be... but there's this medicine this magical medicine yeah yeah you know and in na i'd be classed as not being clean probably because i wasn't in an injection like you know but yeah. like look what i've achieved look what i'm doing i'm not you know and 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 like i want people to know that like there's not one way to come through drugs. There's not one way, there's not one set way. There are ways that people do it and there's programs out there, but it's not just that way. Recovery is all about how you get there and, and what works for you, you know? What and, would you say to someone who views crackheads and views heroin addicts as scum? I say you are so fucking small minded and I guarantee you, you're only saying that because you've probably got a father, a brother, a mother, uh, you know, uh, someone who was on it themselves and it grew you to hate them that much that you hate them, you know? He's a, you know, most drug dealers are drug dealers because their, their, their mum and dad was on it. Mm. I know, like, it, it, it's mad to think, but... Because I used to have a very negative view of... Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Junkies and I, 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 I would just say, like, like, it can happen to anyone, you know? And some of the most intelligent, funny, funniest people I've ever met were people who were, were drug addicts, you know, and, the, you know, it was just one girl, I, she was the fittest girl growing up. She's, a, she's writ off now, like, you know, and, you know, like, Sad. it's like this girl was the thing, like, she was the thing that everyone wanted to tear, mm. and now, like, she's fucked on drugs. Addiction's a killer, man, and it, it literally can happen to anyone, and these people who might be calling people junkies, 
okay, maybe you haven't got a relative who's on drugs, but your son, your daughter, they might end up being drug addicts. You never know. You like, need to understand it. Yeah, it's it's you, just, we're all human, like, you know, and just because you take something and you're addicted to something, it doesn't make you a bad person. Yes, we do we do bad things on it sometimes, but, you know, we, we, we just, like, I don't know, man, I just think we need to be a bit more humane about stuff. You're what, 31 now? 32. Where do you see yourself in another five years? What are you going to be doing? In five years? Because you're blowing up, you're blowing up your podcast. You're yeah. very successful in your podcast because you have a wonderful way about you. It, Liam said the same. You seem like you're a lovely gentleman. Yeah, you've got a great like, way of oh, talking. You're a great talker. Yeah. So where do you see? I, I I I see the Central Club being a network more more than a podcast. I see it being a network uh, where you know we're making big waves in in in, in media. You know, I, I, I'll hire you, mate. Sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I see the Central Club being bigger more than a podcast. Um, and if you want to call it a podcast, we'll be the biggest in the UK in five years time, 100%. Um, I want my, I want to be recognized in the world of recovery. I, I, I just want, I want people to look at me and say, wow, yeah, like whether it's a divorce, whether it's you've just got sacked from a job, whether you've just lost money on a horse. Like I want you to know that like it ain't over for you. Like you can turn your life around. What it, it's never too late. Like, you know, mm. that's what I want people to look at when they see me is like, do you know what? Like life ain't so bad actually. Like and, and it well, ain't the, end of the world. Yeah. I've enjoyed this time, man. I think it's been a very fascinating conversation. I think a lot of people who don't know about drugs will do yeah. well to hear from the drugs and it may hopefully help a lot of people. So Yeah, no, thank you for having me, Tom. Like it's 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 been funny because you've been on my podcast twice. Yeah. And uh, you know, when when you asked me to come on, I was like really truly humbled because, yeah. you know, like I said, it's this an important story. You do, like. And when I met you, that's why I said, that's why I travelled there for that Derek Diablo, not for you, you little prick, Derek, because I know you'll be watching. Yeah, well, like a lot of people said that, like when you, like from that podcast, and you were like, people were like, fair play to Tommy, mm. like, do you know what I mean? Like, because you didn't have to come down for that. And mm. just for the record, let's let's just say it on here. Like, let's get some of this on you now, innit? Because then, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, so. I'm still getting ma- messages of that, rat, you of that rat McGovern. <laughs> oh, true, true. Oh. No, but listen, listen, right? Let's just, let's just say, town. right? I, he was down here, you just so happened to be here. Yeah. If there was anyone you would have a debate with, on, if I was getting you to debate, it wouldn't have been him. He's like, clown. like, like, yeah. and, and you said that, like, yeah. so when I phoned Tommy, he went, I'm not giving this guy any airtime, he's a sausage. Yeah. You obviously got reminded that he called you out in a video, and you phoned me, he was like, do you know what? Because it's, it's for you, and you just tell him to come, all yeah. right? The fact he tried making up that we set him up, and that, that, it was a boxing ring. Because he shit himself. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. all it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he yeah. had his moment in England, yeah? He's picked his name up, he had his perfect moment, and he lay down on the sofa. Like and he'll him. probably try and get a Do resurgence, this, yeah, yeah, because of this, like, but uh, no, like, you know, he, he, he fucked him, mate. Like, anyone I who hasn't him. watched this, I've done a podcast on, on, on the centre. You had them all, Reco- uh, Gavin McGuinness and all that. They, oh, yeah, they done that. like a, a reaction on it. Like yeah. it, it was wild, mate. <laughs> it wasn't just mad. It was funny. And like yeah, he, I said to him though, I said to that, the, like he hasn't spoke to me since. He's literally blocked me and I. Like he's t- switched on me. He tried doxing my studio, my workplace. He's really got bitter about it. He tried making out with me and my dad, and we, we all like like we've got time in the world to like make stuff up for him this guy like this little American yeah and my dad was saying to him before he was like listen don't because he was on about like um, he was like I've got an idea for a sketch he's going this is the day before because I said listen don't make a mug of my platform I said you and him can have a real good debate here I'm giving you a chance here right and my dad's like and he was right he's saying listen Diablo because he's so deluded he was like you're not the A side, you're like nobody knows you. Yeah, yeah. He said, Tommy's the A side, right? Don't think you're this like magical guy. Just go there, be humble, and 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 because he can, yeah, he, he knows random shit, don't he? Like, do you know what I mean? And I thought, but he, he just random. went into he went into this mad mode, like with the yeah. goggles on and that. And come in from the minute I sh- at that point, I should have either walked out or ironed him out from the minute he walked in. Yeah, uh, well, everyone's like that, idiot. How did you put it? Anyone oh, who anyone who didn't like you before that show, yeah. was on your side at the end of that yeah, show. Yeah, but I think, yeah, it didn't, it didn't bode well for him. It finished him. It finished him. Because yeah. before that, he had this sort of like, a little bit of an image as this funny American yeah, who's yeah, a football yeah. hooligan. Well, you tried being reasonable yeah, with it, didn't that, you? He was like, just... 
Are you a joke? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I thought he was. But then yeah. I thought, no, nah, he's serious. But he seems to think that like you've signed a deal and stuff for a boxing match. Is off this his, true or what? Absolutely off his head, buff. It's, off his, it's, it's off all his lies. It's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. He tried saying he was on the undercard for a Saudi fight. I think it was one of the, the, the big ones like and stuff. <laughs> yeah. He ain't doing shit. No one knows you. Yeah. Derek, give up, mate. All right? Yeah. But bro, enough about that little clown. It's yeah, a, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure, mate. Oh, thank honestly, you. thank you and so much. I wish much you luck as well, man. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Anyway, guys, and like I said, it's never too late. Never too late to change. If you're watching this, like it, share it, share it with everyone. You know we're censored. You know we're silenced. I think this was a very important subject, very different to the usual subjects I cover, but it is an inspirational yeah. story and a success story, and it's a positive story. So I very much enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank bro. you. Carry on watching for more interesting guests. I'll talk to anyone. I'll debate anyone. I'll hear anyone's story. If you want to help me along that way, it's not free. I need your support. If you can support my family, that gives me my peace of mind. It means I can continue to do the work I do. You can do so at www.supporttommy.com. I appreciate every bit of support, as do my children. Gives me the ability to fly them out here to see me so I can stay in constant contact with them. I'm the platform and I'm censored, so I need you. I need you to share this content. Make sure you stay tuned for upcoming weekly guests, interesting guests, exciting guests. I'm Tom Robson, and this has been my podcast, Silence.